guess you can start right there. Oh, wow. Thank you. Okay. So I think we do use the desk um, on laptop. So I think we do. Yes. Yeah. Just going to move forward. Yeah. There we go. Cool beans. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay, team, it is 6.30, and you know what that means. All right, welcome. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, so the first item of business is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, so I think uh, we have a one item to pull, which is uh, so the zoning, zoning fix. Zoning fixes, correct. Yeah. Which um, is item seven. Postpone that till the next meeting. Uh, are there any other changes to the agenda? Okay, so we'll consider the agenda um, approved um, uh, without objection. Uh, and so uh, the next item is general business and appearances, which is a time um, for anyone from the public to address the city council on any issue uh, that is otherwise not on our agenda. And I'm going to take a privilege of going first, um, which is to say that I want to um, just take a minute and, and recognize this is our, our first regular council meet meeting since the, the passing of um, Nancy Sherman and uh, Sergeant Jennings. And so I just want to um, recognize um, that they're great service to the city of Montpelier. I'm very th thankful for them. So that's, Thank you. yes, Thank you. for sure. All right, so um, if there is any member of the public who would like to address the council on any other item, um, otherwise not on our agenda. And if and this is true for other things when, when you uh, come up to comment, if you would say your name and uh, uh, where you're from and try to keep your comments to two minutes or less uh, so we can keep the conversation going. Okay, we're gonna keep going then. Okay, so the next item is consideration of the consent agenda. Uh, do we have a motion regarding that? Okay, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so our first uh, regular business item is um, the Riverfront Access uh, presentation. So I'm going to invite all of those who are part of that to come on up to the front table, and I'm going to move, um, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Okay. <coughs> Would y'all mind saying your names oh, before you yeah. start? Yeah. Do you want us to say our names? <coughs> sure. Ricarda Erickson with the Vermont River Conservancy. Um, Regina Leonard, I'm a landscape architect with uh, Milona McBroom. Your voices are not being picked up by the mic, so I'm going to ask you to go back so I can, everybody can hear your names. Thank you. <coughs> um, Ricarda Erickson with the Vermont River Conservancy. And I'm Regina Leonard with <coughs> Milona McBroom. Uh, Steve Libby with the Vermont River Conservancy. Uh, Roy Schiff with Milona McBroom. Thank you for this opportunity to present to you this evening. We've introduced ourselves, and I wanted to give you a little bit of history of kind of where we got, how we got to this point. And going back to the August 22nd City Council meeting, we came before you, and you authorized us to do a conceptual design and feasibility study for the newly designated Confluence Park at the point where the North Branch River comes into the main stem of the Winooski River on the city-owned transit center property. And we then immediately put out an RFP and hired Malone and McBroom to do these conceptual designs and feasibility study with us. 
We also gathered an advisory committee of 17 people from diverse professions throughout Vermont. And we held three public meetings to get public input as to what was important to people when considering the design for this Confluence Park. We now have three design concepts and a feasibility <coughs> study to present to you tonight. We are not asking you to choose which one of the three is your favorite. We're not going to be voting on that tonight. But they are meant to show you what is possible at this place, what is possible for a Confluence Park. And we would like to ask you for a commitment moving forward to authorize the Vermont River Conservancy to work with the Montpelier Parks Department and uh, any other applicable city offices to further develop a design for the Confluence Park and to move ahead <laughs> towards realizing this vision of a Confluence Park here. And we all know that a lot has changed since August 22nd in Vermont. I mean, sorry, in Montpelier, the, especially in this particular area. There's a lot of projects, new projects happening, new development. And I want to just briefly address that when we are referring to the Confluence Park tonight, we may refer to it as the Confluence Park West. And that is because it's on the west side of the North Branch River. Throughout the four months, an opportunity came to the table to look at the Moat lot, which is on the east side of the North Branch River. And the city is now thinking about other opportunities <coughs> moving ahead with that lot. And VRC is happy to serve on a committee to look at different options. And internally, we refer to that lot, the Moat lot, as Confluence Park East. It's not going to be part of the conceptual design tonight because we know it's very early on in that phase of thinking and it's not necessarily on the table as a viable option at this point. But, when we, but we do hold it in a broader vision of what could be. And so we will refer to that a little bit tonight, the Confluence Park East, but know that what we are presenting to you tonight, the conceptual designs are for the Confluence Park West. Um, and I would like to, at this point, hand it over to Regina to continue the presentation. Great. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to present um, these ideas to you tonight. Um, and I just wanted to give you a little background, a little context, and a little Ricardo uh, talked a little bit about the project and how it came to be. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is just some of the considerations um, that we, ha we looked at um, as moving the concepts forward. Um, really the ultimate goal is, is to create a riverfront park for the community. And so some of the considerations um, are river access and accessibility. So trying to appeal to multiple users and users of all abilities. Um, to create new recreation opportunities, especially on the river, to think about flood resilience, um, to consider the context of the park to the downtown and to the city and to the city's history, and to think about this area as a public space and what it could be and how it could serve the community, and then finally how to integrate the, the bike path. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and I'll walk you through some of those tonight. Um, and then just the other piece of this is thinking about Confluence East on the other side, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that further <coughs> on, but it's really looking at those opportunities um, to knit, knit those together, um, those spaces. So all of those things that I just mentioned, those design considerations, were really um, project objectives that have been guided and then reinforced through community outreach. So, so all of these were really guided by the public input um, that came even prior to this project with the many sort of input sessions and community sessions that you've held with the Taylor Street lot and the car lot, but then also uh, the Vermont River Conservancy and the public meetings that they conducted as part of this project. So um, they met three times and, and had an opportunity to hear some of the public uh, input 
And these are just some of the themes, and you see that they really mirror some of the design considerations. Um, river access, balance of uses, um, looking at um, recreational opportunities, a boat launch, um, thinking about the environmental components, white water opportunities, fishing, um, and then sitting areas, trees and vegetation, different levels uh, from which to view the river and the, and the landscape, um, shelters and picnic tables, year-round usability, um, maybe opportunities for play. There was a lot of ideas. Um, people wanted to incorporate history if possible, maybe pay uh, some homage to uh, the Native American ancestry um, on the site or in the city. Um, and then think about views both of the river and, and back to the capital and, and general beautification opportunities for public art. So um, a lot of input and a lot of great ideas and, and things that we considered uh, moving the concepts forward. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background um, on the site. Uh, there are some historic preservation um, considerations. Uh, this is in the Montpelier Historic District, and so we have to be cons considerate of historic character and the context. Um, there's potential archaeological resources on the site, um, and including the retaining walls that are there that date back to the 19th century, and there may be some underground archaeological resources that might come up in the future as this park is developed. Um, and, and generally, the treatment of historic landscapes kind of follows the Secretary of the Interior's standards. It's the National Park Service. And they generally require review and approval at the, at the state level, um, sometimes the local level as well. Safety and access considerations. Obviously, you have a very steep site and you have um, shoreline access. If, if that's something that you want to achieve, you have to be cons consider that there is a 17-foot elevation change. You have a channelized slope with um, structures. And um, just for a point of reference, um, universal access, if we were to try to get people all the way down to the river, would require 240 linear feet of ramp. So that was one of the things we explored and we looked at, uh, the extent of universal access. Um, and then how to integrate the bike path. The bike path goes through the, east, uh, the west confluence site, um, kind of breaks it in two. And so um, we looked at different ways to integrate the bike path. And then finally, the railroad. You have a railroad right-of-way that borders one part of the property, and so um, managing public access points <coughs> around that railroad is something to consider. And then there are the environmental considerations. Um, this is in a special flood hazard area. It's a, it, the whole downtown, in fact, is in the 100-year floodplain. Um, and so we have to think about flood resiliency, opportunities for um, improving flood capacity, perhaps, but also just looking at how things are constructed and, and the design proposal and making sure that it's resilient to flooding. Um, riparian vegetation, um, because this is sort of a man-made environment, there's not a lot of high-value vegetation out there now, but a project um, of this scope presents a great opportunity to improve the habitat and riparian vegetation um, in the area and along the river. And then finally, site remediation. This is a site that has had um, known contamination, and so it's been cleaned up, and so any um, further impacts would need to go through uh, a permitting process. So those are all some of the considerations. And then finally, um, if you look down at the bottom of the screen, we have the uh, proposed, um, let me see if I can do this, all right. I'm not good with a track mouse. I probably won't do this a lot because it'll drive everybody crazy. <laughs> um, but we have the proposed west confluence site that you can see, and then the proposed east confluence site. And then all the green areas uh, denote sort of public open spaces within the downtown or within walking distance of the downtown. And these are all connected by the proposed bike path and the um, central Vermont recreation pass and the cross Vermont trail. And so one of the reasons that I mentioned this is that this area, as Ricardo mentioned, is going through an incredible transformation. And so you have the transit center, you have the confluence, what we're calling Confluence West. Um, you have, and this is you know a maybe, but you have other amenities that are in flux right now, like the parking garage perhaps. You have Confluence East and that parcel that's open for development or redevelopment. 
And then you have river restoration and access, and that's something that I'll talk a little bit about further on because we, we also have been looking at ways to restore the river. Um, so these all, all open up opportunities to really capitalize on the full potential um, of this area to face the river. You have all this development happening, and what a great opportunity to really have that development orient itself toward the river um, so that you have connected public spaces um, and unified with a unified design language and great access to the river. So with that, I'm just going to get into the conceptual design. I'm going to show you um, really three concepts, and they all achieve something a little bit different. So I'm going to stay rather high level tonight, um, but certainly if you have questions, um, feel free to free ask. Um, so again, the considerations as we approach this is river access, accessibility, recreational opportunities, flood storage and resiliency, context and history, what, what is the quality of the public space, and then the integration of the shared use path. So the first concept, we're calling this the performance park. And, and really, these are just themes so that you understand each of these achieves something a little bit better than some of the other concepts. Um, what this concept does is it, is it incorporates the bike path, but it expands the space. Um, it envelops the bike path on either side. So it utilizes the existing sort of graded flat area to the absolute maximum. And what that does is that allows a, a larger public space so that then you can accommodate small <coughs> concerts and community events. So you'll see that this, um, this features, this uh, concept features a per performance pavilion with seating along the front so that you can sit there and eat your lunch on a nice summer day. Um, again, it integrates the bike path without uh, interruption. And it creates a large accessible overlook. So I'm going to talk a lot about the overlooks. And this area right here in all of the concepts is one of the, the spots for an overlook. Um, and it's just a perfect spot. It, it sits a little bit down. Um, it has this great view. And it has the historic walls. And so um, this one has a large accessible overlook. Um, and it provides some access, so there's um, accessibility to that large overlook. Um, and then the river access for fishing um, and a boat launch. It's a little bit steeper because we've maximized the space at the top of the site. And I'll just show you a couple of section elevations. So um, if you look down at the um, image on the lower left of the screen, you see the dashed red line. That shows you how we've cut the section and which way the arrows show which way we're facing, just to help you orient. So this shows kind of a line with um, a section of the um, pavilion, and then you can see the seating at the front of the pavilion, um, and then a little bit of a path space. And a lot of the plantings kind of create opportunities for seating, so we berm those up and we have stone seating, and it provides a little bit of pedestrian scale. And then um, the bike path, you can see how that's sort of integrated in the space. And then a stabilized slope with plantings and seating opportunities, and then a path and access down by the river. This one I'll, exp I'll uh, just, I know this is going to get tiresome of looking at all of these. Um, yeah, so. Um, if you look at your handouts, and, and all of you, if you want to download these at a later date, um, you can just take a look at, at how these spaces are divided. Um, where are these going to be available? Or you're, you're going to send us all? We'll send you the materials. We'll, we'll in fact, I have a drive okay. I can give you tonight. That would be great. Yes, yeah, so you, you can post them. Um, so in this one, it just gives you a sense of that multi-use plaza space. It cuts between it, um, and then the tiered um, pathways down to the river's edge. So the next concept, um, we call the riverine park. It's pop. Oh, did I skip one? Skip OK, the, I'll uh, go back to it. Yeah, Sorry. The plan B for B. B. I don't know how I did that. Right OK, there, yeah. there we go. Woo. So the next concept, um, 
is what we call Heritage Park. And the reason that we we're calling this Heritage Park is that um, this, this is really, one of the things that we heard from people is that they, they really wanted us to pay uh, tribute to the Native American culture. Um, and so this one is, is really crafted on sort of the concept of a medicine wheel. And so you have axis on the north, south, east, and west. Um, if you look at the, um, the handouts, you can have a little bit more of a description of them, but the idea here is that it's this great opportunity for in interpretation, um, and you have east, west, north, and south are all representative of different seasons, and there's a whole host of interpretive information that you learn a lot about uh, culture, and there are spirit, um, spirit animals um, with each of these directions, and so those would be featured as figurines in the garden space, so this great opportunity for public art and uh, interpretation. So this features a center, central plaza. So the big idea in this is that in this scheme, the bike path sort of gets integrated and absorbed by this really vibrant, energetic public space. And there's seating along the middle, a raised planted area um, with a central element, um, like a totem or, or something that's really exciting and visually um, exciting to look at. Seating along the edge. And then the overlook is accessed, it's flush with the plaza and it's accessed by um, a shelter. So just a small little shelter. So it has this niche little lawn space, which would be really cool. Um, and then this concept also provides um, two accessible overlooks um, and a fishing platform. <laughs> so if you, if you look, let me see if I can get us there. So we have this, this overlook, and then we've got one at the top of the site right here, and then a fishing platform here. So in this one, you can see there's a lot of ramp, but because we've structured the, the ramps with walls, we're able to make the most out of the space, compress it, and get people down to a fishing platform so uh, people can fish in the river. And there's also access um, down via paths as well and, and step, stepping stones. And again, on this one, um, just to look through the site, you can see the different levels. On this one, again, you're cutting through the plaza. And then the sorry, last... Parse the time. Yeah, okay. sorry. Um, the last concept is the uh, Riverine Pockets Park. I just want to double check. The first one that I got... Was use your microphone. Sorry, the first one that I got says Concept C, and a second version that says concept Yeah, scene. one of them has the river as for context. The other one is um, has the concept just a little bit bigger if you wanted you to see some of the details. You should, you should have A, B, and C. We got two C's. I have C. I have two C's. I have a C's. I haven't seen them. Yeah, I don't have an A. Oh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> well, it's basically what's up on the, um, the screen, and it's the two versions of the same view, yeah. So, um, so then this final scheme is really the idea of creating a separate area for the bike path and creating more of a riverine experience. So this is a more linear park and it, and it is a sloped park, um, but it does feature um, two accessible overlooks and a fishing platform. It provides river access for fishing and a boat launch. Um, and you can see that the bike path goes through and then the amenities for the bike path or, or the multi-use path are on the left-hand side. It's sort of on the north side of the trail. So you have an opportunity to put your, your bikes away uh, if you want to go down and explore the park. So this is a much more of a linear experience but it's also much more private and the spaces are smaller, more of a niche experience. And that just has to do with the fact that we're putting a lot of program in a, in a really sloped, small space. So I won't, because of the time, get into these, but you can take a look and see. And then finally, um, the other thing we looked at is we looked at sort of the breakdown of cost of what, you know, what do these, <coughs> 
um, concepts represent in terms of um, potential budgets. Um, and so what we did is we, we did a cost breakdown. And you can see here that just for your purposes, we looked at um, earthwork and construction. That's about a quarter of the budget right there. Retaining walls and paths, another you know 20% or so. And then amenities, bike rack seating, uh, all the things that help to make the place the place is another quarter of, of the budget. Um, and the rest kind of gets divided out um, between some of the features, design and permitting, um, stormwater, things like that. Um, and then I'm not going to spend any time on this, but the other piece of this is if you're investing in, in river access and creating these wonderful places to get to the river, um, having a, a river that's clean and safe for swimming and fishing and exciting for, for boating opportunities, that's all part of um, the strategy as well. So, so we have been looking at that, um, and we do have, I think, a slide that addresses that. So I think that's it for us, and I'll just have Ricardo, will wrap it up. Yep, I just want to do a two-minute wrap-up. Um, so the confluence is a point where two or more rivers merge and become one. The water of one river is not lost at a confluence, as is the case with the North Branch here, whose water mingles with the Winooski and eventually flows into our Great Lake Champlain. And confluence is a word that could apply to our city as well. As the capital city and located in the center of the state, Montpelier is a merging point for the people of Vermont. So here, this picture is the Confluence Park this past November. Let's consider this the before picture. We have the opportunity now to define the after picture. Like the rivers that flow along its shores, imagine <coughs> a place for people to come together from all walks of life for the residents of the transit center in the French block to sit in their backyard, alongside a legislator on her lunch break, for a high school student to pause for a moment as he walks along the multi-use path on his way home from school, for a grandparent to sit with a grandchild on the river's edge looking for heron, otter, or pileated woodpeckers, for visitors staying at the hotel to stop and enjoy our riverside park before heading out to our shops and restaurants, an angler casting a line for a wild trout, a kayaker paddling waters that will take her to Waterbury. Through our public outreach, we have heard resounding support for the Confluence Park. You, this city council, has the opportunity to be a critical part of transforming our Confluence Park into an after picture that is vibrant with a diversity of people enjoying the many amenities and opportunities provided by Riverside Park. The after picture could be that of a small parcel that created a huge transformation for our city, where the human landscape mimics the merging of rivers, a confluence that brings together people as one community. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's very exciting. Uh, so, dear council and public, I know it's going to be very tempting to comment on these designs right now, but that is not the point. <laughs> right? right? So, um, I have thoughts that I want to share with you, but I'm going to save that for another time. Um, because the, I think the point right now is, uh, are, are we going to uh, continue to support your process? And um, I'm going to open it up to counselors first, and then the public. And then we'll see if there's a motion. Any comments from city council? Yeah, go ahead. I guess I'm sort of curious um, what kinds of resources the city would be expected to bring to the table. Yep, so <laughs> we. <laughs> resources? Resources, yes. Um, and not just like money, but like people mm -hmm. time and. We envision a process moving forward that is collaborative and it would be the Vermont River Conservancy working alongside the Parks Department and any other applicable city um, commissions or um, offices and to, to define what, what that um, separation or uh, shared um, resource is. So I think that is 
to be determined. I think that what Vermont River Conservancy would bring to the table is our experience working um, on river restoration and public access and also our ability to seek funding sources. So that's the level of collaboration and resources that I think we, we know at this time, but we are open to um, what plan might develop. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just, I, this is maybe, a, well, we're gonna have a budget discussion later. Um, I'm just, I support this and I think I, I would love the city to be at the table. Um, I'm just a little concerned about like how we're spreading resources out <coughs> parks side of things um, and I also I, I noticed you said city offices does that include like other shareholders that are active in the area like other organizations that are doing work like we had the sustainable Montpelier piece mm -hmm. are, 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 is it like everyone who is involved in this sort of city design and development that's invited or is it just <coughs> yes we're okay. happy to collaborate um, trust for public land would be a great resource mm -hmm. to collaborate with other comments? Donna. Well, I definitely support the city getting involved, and maybe we need Bill and the staff to give us feedback to estimate time and what they can handle. But I, I'm assuming they can say, yes, we can, or yes, we can't, anytime you need something. And we'll just keep track of it, I guess, is how I feel as far as staff allotment. And both of you did such a great job of explaining what could be very confusing up there. So thank you. It was well done. I really appreciate your work. Thank you also. I think that all three of these designs look great to me. So uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the next steps. And in that direction, I just want to follow up and ask, um, again, where online uh, the public might be able to find these images uh, and when the next step is going to happen. Yeah, we'd be happy to share them. Um, for the, if the city wants to put them up on the web, city website, we can put them on the Vermont River Conservancy website. We haven't put, this is the first um, unveiling of the concept, so we, they aren't currently available, but as soon as um, tomorrow morning, we can get them But up. next time, <laughs> you're going to share this with us ahead of time, right? Yes. Yes, great. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, sorry, and then uh, what exactly is the, the next step, and when would that next meeting be if it's a public meeting? To, to be determined, okay. yeah. Open, yeah. Okay. Uh, comments from the public? Go ahead. <laughs> that I should give. My name is Katie Michaels and I live in Montpelier and I'm on the Montpelier Conservation Commission and I just wanted to share on behalf of the commission how excited we are about this project and how excited we are for the possibility of increased public access and connection. I think connection almost more than access to the river and acknowledgement of this thing that flows through our city. Um, so we're really excited to continue to be part of the advisory committee and support the project. And thanks to PRC for your leadership. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Bob Hines. I live in Montpelier, and I've spent a fair amount of time in the river in, in this area. Um, and I think it's a great idea. But I, I think this park's got to be part of an, an overall plan for how you, you're going to use the river. People are talking about taking out a number of dams. There's uh, from what I understand, proposed river access at uh, Caledonia Spirits, and actually I don't exactly know what the status of that is, but there, you have a great opportunity to, to come up with a plan on, on, on how you're going to use the whole uh, river through Montpelier, and there's a great river access right behind Montpelier High School, which no one really knows about, but it's a, one of the best places to get in the river in that area. I mean, you've got people using uh, right below the, uh, the the dam on Pioneer Street. There's a big outcropping. People come down there and sunbathe. I mean, if, if 
if you could take out some of the dams, you have a great uh, access all the way from Barry, really, you know, down down to Middlesex. So I, I think you need to come up with a plan for what you're going to do with all of this. Uh, and also things like the Wrightsville Dam is now un, under relicensing. And do you want to get involved with that in terms of flows and maybe some bottom releases to warm the water up in the winter and cool it down in the summer? I mean, I mean there's a lot you can do, and this is just part of the whole plan, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that reminds me, uh, Rosie Kruger, who is uh, not here tonight, uh, sent me an email and uh, wanted to uh, weigh in that we use this time to suggest to you all that uh, there may be some possibility in tying some of these other access points together um, to Confluence Park and uh, including the site at or the access potential access point at Caledonia Spirits at Old Country Club Road, which I think maybe you know about, as well as uh, uh, Timber Homes. And uh, maybe there's a water trail or some kind of theme in the signage or some other um, kind of tie-in. So anyway, I just want to put that out there. That's a great point. Other comments? OK. Uh, so is there a um, motion on the table? How do you want to state it? <laughs> Uh, you could refer to, I think you got a, an email oh, from oh, Ricarda that might have some to that language. Jack, if you have it, you go ahead. I think I have it. Uh, I oh. would move to continue the development of the Confluence River Park uh, by authorizing the Vermont River Conservancy, Montpelier Parks Department, and other appropriate city offices to conduct more in-depth public process, uh, refine plans, and collaborate on a fundraising plan. Skipped a couple of things in there, but. Second. Okay, further discussion? D does that have all the points that, I did find the agenda page and it just brought up to, to study all the access issues and specific proposal to improve the newly approved Confluence Park area. Was that in there, Glenn? If it was, fine. Uh, the, I think the language you read was from Ricardo's email, right? Yes. So oh, okay. Should I was reading the one off the f yeah. agenda. Okay. So that should be okay. fine, right? Yeah. Yes, okay. that's good. I think that you're referring to the background information of what um, we had done okay. until now. Okay, good. Okay. All right, further discussion. All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. So I just toss in um, if this is going to continue to be a city project, which I think is exciting, we certainly, the staff would really like to make sure that um, some of our key folks are involved in the planning. I know Public Works in particular has some. some needs in that area for access of certain things, so we make sure whatever designs or, or you know, some of these I think might work with what they need and some might not, and just, you know, we want to make it as accessible as possible. So if you can include our folks in at the front end, that would be great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your work. Thanks. It's very exciting. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to uh, uh, the second hearing of uh, parking ordinance. So this is, uh, we've we made some changes the last time, so um, I'm going to open up a, the public hearing at this point and start with council. Are there any comments for, uh, any changes or anything on uh, the parking ordinance as changed last time? It's my impression is that it is where we want it to be, and yes. I think we can move through this pretty quickly. Fantastic. Would, they, would anybody like to, oh, uh, actually, uh, any comments from the public to on the parking ordinance? Open the public I did already. Okay. <coughs> okay. I'm going to, unless anybody wants to comment on the parking ordinance. Just making sure. Okay. Oh, great. Great. Uh, we're going to close the public hearing. Um, on that, is there uh, a motion? I, I make a motion to approve all four ordinance as amended at the first hearing. Second. 
Wait, at the first, at this, you uh, mean at oh, the second at the hearing? What? Because this is really the third hearing oh, at on the this. the second hearing, sorry. Yeah. Okay. During the second hearing? From the last, the, from the last meeting. Last meeting, yeah, or okay. Last, last time it was. As proposed. As proposed, there we go. And I'll second. Does that, does that sound okay, yeah, Don? Okay. Sense. Great, further discussion? All right, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, all right, the zoning fixes is off of our list, so now we are up to the investment policy. So I'm going to invite uh, Terrence Field up to the table here. So and he's the chair of our investment committee. Hi. Hi. I don't know if you want to say anything about this, but... Uh, sure, I can say a few things. <laughs> cool. Um, so we've been working on this for a while. Um, we're seeking uh, approval of an amendment to the city's investment policy. Um, We've been, for a while now, we've been talking about adding um, environmental social government restrictions almost to the policy, because it's been kind of wide open. Um, we've worked with the investment advisor that the committee works with to manage the portfolios that we manage for the city, and we came up with some language. Uh, I would call this kind of a first step. You know, we may go back and revisit this over time, <coughs> but you've got to keep in mind that we, you know, we manage several portfolios, most of them are fairly small. So it's real difficult to achieve the, the, the level of diversification that you want in a very small portfolio. Um, so we've tried to, you know, stratify that in the in the language that we're putting in the policy in terms of you know how we're going to manage uh, portfolios less than three hundred thousand dollars and portfolios greater than three hundred thousand dollars. So the language is in there, and I could try to answer the questions that you might have. Well, I'm thrilled about this. I think it's great that we're taking these steps and it's taken us some, some time to get to this point. Um, and uh, yeah, any comments from council? I know, I know you, well, so Donna, do you have something? No, Go ahead, no, you had to hand up. read so I could almost understand it, so good for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, if I could um, take the liberty of adding a little bit of background sure. here. Um, the, so um, one possibility for uh, an investment strategy, uh, given uh, you know potential social responsibility restrictions, is uh, one possibility is you start from nothing and you say what are you going to invest in, and build up from zero. And the other um, way to do it is to start with, okay, if we're investing in more or less everything now, um, what are we going to take out of that that we you know don't want to be a part of, and uh, it just, be, particularly because of the size of our accounts, it turned out to be easier to do the second, to say, you know, we're invested in all of these things, and so we're going to um, particularly um, not, a, as we can anyway, um, not invest in, um, you know, these certain types of things. And so, the, and then the, the list is there. Um, okay, so that's just for context. Um, it's how we arrived at this point. So I don't mean to... It's probably more detail than you really need. <laughs> I, I have a separate motion, but I think it's best if we consider this first and fair and enough. Tag on to okay, that. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so is there uh, any public comment on this on the investment policy? Okay, um, I um, and comments from council. Go ahead, Glenn. Um, Thank you. Uh, I almost could understand it too, so I appreciate that, <laughs> like Donna. Um, I would like to go in just a little bit closer to those tiers um, because I think I understand the intent. Uh, accounts with a total value under 300,000 are relatively, you can do what you want with them because they're not big enough it's going to be very difficult right. to diversify at that level. Right. And then the those accounts over 300,000 um, that last long sentence while the manager shall exclude direct investments in the industry sectors identified in order to gain exposure to certain asset classes and so on it may be necessary to purchase shares of mutual funds and or ETFs that do have some exposure. So c can you just kind of expand on that a little bit to so I understand because it, I I think I understand that that you're you have some freedom even with those larger accounts but 
what exactly is the difference, I think, is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Could, could you restate it? <laughs> so in a, in a larger, you know, a fund greater than $300,000, uh, more likely as it goes up in size, the investment advisor would have more flexibility to invest in individual securities. Okay. So that gives them the flexibility of saying, okay, we're not going to invest in, you know, Smith & Browning or whatever. Um, however, to still achieve the overall goal of that portfolio, there may need there may be some value in adding a, a mutual fund or an ETF, and, and when you get into those, you don't have a lot of say in terms of unless you buy a particular sector mutual fund that says, okay, we're only going to this, this mutual fund only invests in solar energy, but if we're trying to achieve diversification, you might get a fund that has some shares in Exxon Mobil. That's not our intent, but our, it is our intent to diversify and meet the goal of the particular portfolio. Did that help? That sort of okay. Helps. Yes, Great. Don, uh, Don. I thought of it as bundle services. Like when you go to get cable TV, you get a certain bundle, and you're stuck with more things than you want just to get a certain channel. Right. To, and to so some degree smaller that's smaller mutuals are bundled, and you can't separate them right. because they're so small. Right. The mutual funds, they have, you know, obviously certain um, directors, their, their, their objectives of that fund, and if that fits into our, one of our overall portfolios, we like what that fund is doing, but it may still be investing in yep. one or two companies or something like that that don't fit what we're trying to do, but it, we don't feel it over, overall taints what we're trying to do. Uh, Ashley. Um, so I was just looking, I've been kind of thinking about this for a bit, and I was just looking at some other um, ESG policies from other entities and organizations. And um, one of the things that I am curious if we might be willing to explore is sort of having um, having like a, a, a philosophy, like an investment philosophy as part of our policy. Um, I always struggle. I think this came up when we were talking about uh, charter changes as well. You know, I think that there, I, I, these are certainly fine starting points, I think, for, for things that, um, you know, we don't want uh, to invest in. Um, but I think that there are other things too, you know, human rights violations that may, you know, that, that may be being committed by certain companies that are invested elsewhere or doing business elsewhere. Um, you know, I think uh, public health uh, and public safety, for example, you know, if um, depending on what the city stance is, uh, you know, about certain um, drug manufacturers, for example, or, you know, something like that. Um, it, it strikes me that maybe having a, a guiding philosophy as well as these are the things that we will absolutely, you know, not invest in, but also looking um, at sort of the, <coughs> these other pieces as well, because we can say, sure, a hard no on the production or manufacture of firearms um, and sale of firearms, but, um, but we're going to be okay with, uh, you know, deforestation in an unsustainable way in some other country because... The return is good for us. I mean, I, I guess I don't really see that as um, savvy financial stewardship um, because it, it may benefit us, but it's kind of how I feel about coal use to generate electricity. That's great for, for those of us that don't have to live with the coal burning in our backyard. Um, and so I, I guess um, I think this is a good starting point, but I, I'm looking for maybe like a, a guiding philosophy that gets incorporated into this um, and, uh, and finding a way to incorporate that into the ESG investment policy overall. Uh, fair enough. I, one of the things that we had gone back and forth about um, for a while there was um, it would, I don't want to speak for the committee, but uh, I think it would probably be safe to say that the committee may not want to be the ones that come up with that philosophy because it is the council's philosophy and not the investment committee's philosophy. And they would, I think, not feel that it is their purview to, to do that. So, I mean, that's something that I think, uh, you know, you or I or um, others on the council, like, we could uh, potentially try to take a crack at that and then bring it, back to the br yeah, bring it to the committee mm -hmm. and, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, vet that sort of, uh, there would be a process around that, I think. But potentially, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jack. Um, hi. Got a couple of questions. Uh, are are most of the city's accounts 
invested in mutual funds or are they invested in uh, individual uh, stocks? Uh, most of the portfolios, I would say, are invested in mutual funds because they're fairly small. And we have one large, larger portfolio that does have individual securities. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you looked at the uh, various uh, SR mutual funds that are out there, like Calvert or whatever, to see how they comport with the standards that are uh, proposed here? We have not, the committee has not. That's something that we would talk to the investment advisor about. And we would, you know, we could ask them to do that and see how that fits in terms of the overall uh, objective of that individual portfolio. Because we don't want to, what we don't want to do is go down a road where, yes, we may be complying, overly complying with this new aspect of the policy, but it may be to the detriment of the performance of the portfolio. So we have to weigh both of mm -hmm. those. Well, yeah, that actually brings it up another question in my mind, which is, this is, all these funds are funds owned by the people of Montpelier, and we certainly have values that we want to uphold, but we also have an obligation to the residents of the city of taking care of their uh, money and uh, getting a good return for them on, on what we have invested. And, that, and that's what the committee weighed a lot in these discussions in terms of, all right, how much of this can we do and at the same time balance, you know, maintaining our fiduciary responsibility of, you know, met, of meeting the objective of that portfolio. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Further comments? Okay. Um, is there a motion? I move that we approve the proposed policy. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Great. And Connor, go ahead. So I, I have a separate motion. I think it's somewhat along the lines of what Ashley was saying um, when I read the policy today. It uh, checked a lot of boxes for me with the you know, firearms, tobacco, fossil fuels. Um, I, I think. There were some things missing in my mind that I wanted to see uh, us delve deeper into. And I appreciated the chair saying this was a, a first step, right? Because um, I think we have a bit more work to do. Uh, looked into Portland, Oregon, who passed an extremely comprehensive divestment policy uh, just a few weeks ago with a couple hundred people coming out and weighing in on it. Um, and they talked about issues like, you know, do we want to support companies that are complicit with like a Trump border wall? Do we want to support private prisons? Do we want to support some of the atrocious actions that Israel has taken in the occupied territories? But a lot of these are quite subjective, right? The ones we're dealing with here are pretty straightforward. That said, I think it warrants some time looking into some of these other issues. Um, I'd be happy to take part in that, but I think just to send a motion to everybody looking, um, we're not done here. So I'd like to present this motion if I could read it. <coughs> The city is committed to integrating environmental, social, and governance criteria into its investment considerations, including the considerations of environmental justice, labor rights, human rights, and good citizenship on the side of companies. Uh, the investment committee will consult with stakeholders and ESG experts to present the council with a plan for such integration. Um, I, don't feel the need to put a timeline on that right now. I hope we can have those conversations. But I, I think this motion is important just to say that we're not done and there will be a second step in this. So would appreciate the support. I will second that. Okay, Donna. I'm just a little confused. You were asking, your motion is asking the committee to do it. The committee said they prefer the council do it. So I like the idea, but I still think it's the council's responsibility more than the committee. Mm -hmm. Would you accept an amendment? Depends on what the amendment is. <laughs> <laughs> that, the, the, instead of having the committee being referred to the yep. committee, have the council do it. I, I accept. We, we I can have a committee of the council. You I, I consider it a friendly amendment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Is, the second Is that okay? Are you okay with that? Okay, so if, if we are going to continue to uh, uh, look into it, then it'll be some subgroup of us. That's, that sounds probably... And bring us back some recommendations. Some okay. We really shouldn't be telling you yep. how to manage the money. Okay. Great, that's fine with me. Um, 
Uh, uh, I'm going to assume that there are some people who are up for doing that. You are. <laughs> eh? mm -hmm. I Ashley? Think so. I think there's also another committee that would be happy to probably participate in that. Oh, OK. Great, super. I take it to mean the social and economic justice Why, committee. yes. OK, great. Fantastic. Um, all right, so further conversation. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? OK. Great. So thank you so much. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. We just divested from fossil fuels. Well, we're not making any new investments in fossil fuels. We're no. not divesting anything. No, no, we aren't. That's what that was. Shall avoid investing. Uh, well, say anyway. Divest, uh, oh, yeah, anyway, we can talk more about that. All right, so moving on. Um, the Montpelier Community Fund and, and Arts Board. Come on up. Welcome. <coughs> I'll start by complimenting the city manager and telling us to be here at 715. That was pretty close. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> This Not my first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to use the projector or anything. No. Okay. Great. Yeah. Then you can close it. it. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you for having us. Um, so we're the uh, uh, we're uh, three out of five or three fifths of the Montpelier Community Fund. Um, Christine Zaki. Ron Wild. Michael Sherman. Um, I'm the current chair of the Community Fund Board, um, and so we um, uh, presented our recommendation to you, the materials for the council meeting, um, and wanted to come this evening to have an opportunity to present um, those recommendations, um, create some context around those recommendations, and answer any questions that you might have. Um, would it be acceptable, Mayor, if I just briefly walk through the memo? Go for it. That I yeah, sent? that's okay. fine. Um, so we just wanted to, um, again, create some context because we're extremely cognizant of the fact that these recommendations um, present a larger number than you've seen in years past. Um, and so we want to talk about the reasons why. Um, so the recommendations for this year total $133,250. Um, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about the context. Um, Last year's um, Montpelier Community Fund grant making totaled $115,500. Um, and then what we saw happen last year was that there were um, three nonprofit ballot requests that went onto the ballot. So there were three nonprofits who had previously uh, applied pretty regularly to the board um, that, that did not apply last year and applied to the ballot. Um, and so those three recommendations totaled $26,000. So if you add our $115,500 that went out the door through this Montpelier Community Fund competitive grant making process, and then that $26,000 that went onto the ballot and was approved by our generous citizen members, um, citizens, um, that totaled $141,500. So um, the context that we just wanted to point out for you is that those three nonprofits who had applied, or uh, who had petitioned to be on the ballot last year and had their um, uh, ballot items approved, came through the door of the Montpelier Community Fund this year. Um, and so there are grant recommendations for those three organizations in the total that we're presenting to you tonight, the $133,250, which is less than the $141,500 that um, the city spent in total on nonprofit grants um, last year. Of course, we cannot um, control whether or not any nonprofits choose to go on the ballot this year. Obviously, that is beyond anyone's scope here. Um, but right now, um, that's uh, our context for the number that we're presenting to you this year. I just wasn't sure. Did everyone that went on the ballot come to the community fund first? Or they no. didn't come at all? No, so okay. um, the, the last year, talking about last year, right? So last, so the, the the policy that was created when the Montpelier Community Fund Board was created was that you can't double dip, 
right? You can't. People have have in the past. So I just wondered if they came to you first and then went to the ballot. They just directly went to the ballot. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. But, yes. But to be clear, they they might do that one year and then the next year, but they can't come to the the timeline doesn't allow it. They can't come to the application process and then change their mind and appeal to the ballot. I mean, the city's rules. I, I know the rules are stated, but people haven't always stayed in it. So that's, I, I just I'm want to make aware, sure. I'm not okay. aware of anyone who's done that. They've There's always done it the next year when they haven't got it <coughs> enough this it was, year. Right. It right, was right, also right, right. the case that it, two of those um, had missed the deadline for various reasons. Um, there were changes in, going on right. in the organization in one of them, and I'm not sure what the second one was. But so that was, they came as petition because they were on, they, they had missed the deadline for yeah. applying to us, to, okay. the, to the board. The other one um, actually decided that they did not want to come to the board, but would go directly to the voters. Okay, thank you. So we can certainly talk at length, if you desire, um, about any of the recommendations um, or any of the trends that we observed and talked about in the memo. Um, but I'm going to stop there and take any questions that the council might have. All right. Go ahead, Ashley. Um, I was just looking. So community connections is listed on here. But from what I understand, that they are no longer the contracted service provider. We don't know so, that. Right. Okay. I, okay. I thought I got an email saying that. So that was erroneous. That, so they're they're going to be continuing to talk about that decision. Okay, but I guess so. Okay, so they're going to continue to talk about it. That's fine. When will we know for sure whether or not the contract is awarded to them? Because what I don't, I mean, yeah. the, this is an organization mm -hmm. that has served Montpelier youth for a while now. But if they don't have the contract. <laughs> And the money's already been allocated and dispersed. I mean, what? Yeah. So if I can take a crack at responding to that. So the funds um, are not dispersed until the summer. New fiscal year, right? Yeah, yeah the new fiscal year. Next fiscal year. Okay. So After July and, one. Um, so there's there's a good chunk of time between now and then, um, and I. Um, um, in my copious amounts of volunteer time available, and also <laughs> going to be serving on the <laughs> school board committee that is looking at this issue. Um, so I'm going to be uh, very well aware of whether or not the community connections contract is awarded, um, and um, will definitely be taking it upon myself to work with the city if we should need to um, take another look at that if community connections is no longer serving the city of Montpelier. If, if I can add, we do have a history of withholding funds. If, I'm if sorry, Ron, I can't hear I'm you. sorry, there is a, uh, a history of withholding funds or delaying funds if the scope of a project has changed or uh, if we learned that it can't be delivered uh, as, as was intended, when was intended. Uh, even yeah. though the funds go out beginning of the fiscal year, it's actually the process at the fiscal year. There are contracts, there's memos, there's letters. So it really ends up being more like August, sometimes even into September. So there so is an opportunity. Do you send wording to that when you award it? Mm -hmm. If there's any change, the money might not happen? I mean, I think the award. Uh, uh, do we need to add wording? Say, if, if there's a significant change in the, in the, in the, in the project, then we, then we ask the we, we oh, actually okay. don't send out the, the, right. the, comes the, from us. the finance department does. Right. Finance and our, our office right. does it. And there are actually contracts for service that. So okay, so when Ron said says we can hold it, he meant we, the, city. the city. The city. We okay. the city. We'd never see. Right. And they so when we it. make a motion, we don't have to <laughs> make a special motion for that. It's already being done. Thank yes. you. Uh, Jack. So the word, so I'm on, on the same topic. So the award letter from the city or whatever would be subject to them providing the services on them being the as provider. described. Yeah. Right. Great. Okay. Glenn. Um, thanks. This is fun to read. Uh, and uh, I am a little bit curious about uh, whether you can speculate about why <coughs> nonprofits go back and forth between ballot requests and, and uh, fund 
uh, applications. I heard that in, in a couple of cases it was just that they missed the deadline. Is there anything beyond that, just sort of happenstance? Yeah, well, I mean, there's certainly one significant um, example, Central Vermont Home and Health, Home Health and Hospice. Um, uh, and so they, in the um, memo that you received, you can see that they went to the ballot twice for $20,000. Um, and I'm not involved with Central Vermont Home and Health and Hospice myself, so I cannot claim to represent their thinking. However, I did have a very long phone call with them last night. Um, so um, I do feel <laughs> updated. Um, and um, from their perspective, they um, um, look at their budget. They look at the number of visits to community members in each of their towns in their region. Um, and then they do a division and they figure out per capita how much they believe each town that they serve should be allocating to them. Um, and so that figure for the city of Montpelier is $20,000. Um, so, you know, if we look at the amount that the Montpelier Community Fund Board has granted over our history, you know, that would be a very significant portion of that total. Um, so in the conversation that we had last night, you know, we talked through that and talked through the fact that, um, you know, I, we understood and appreciated very much their very rational process for coming up with that figure. And at the same time, this is a competitive grant making process where they're, you know, in a application <coughs> portfolio with 43 other applications and that this was a grant application and not an invoice to the city. Um, and so, you know, they were very productive call. It was very positive and they, um, you know, they understand our position and understand that we're presenting um, a grant making portfolio as a whole to the city that represents the very diverse interests of, you know, taxpayers basically, um, you know, and, and <coughs> therefore can't promise to fulfill every single request and fully fund every single request of every single applicant. Um, so that, you know, particular example has sort of been, uh, you know, that's, that's that's been the example that has loomed, loomed large, if you will, mm -hmm. over the past several years. Thank you. Well, um, did you have? Sorry, some, one go more ahead. question. Yeah. A separate topic. Yes. Um, uh, it's also interesting to me that that it is the Montpelier Community and Arts Fund, uh, <laughs> and a bunch of the language uh, references grants to individual artists. And I remember from previous years a couple. Uh, recurring uh, grants to individual artists, but I don't think I see anything like that here in terms of even applications. I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. Uh, have you heard from individual artists? And they say, yeah, we didn't doesn't see apply to me anymore? We, we noticed the same. By the time we see the applications, of course, the deadline has arrived. Um, so I don't, yet yeah, you're right in your observation. I don't know that we have any insight other than it's a, particular kind of thing and yeah. what people are working on and if it's the kind of thing that they feel they could bring to us. But I, sh I think it's important to say that we, when we start this whole process, we send out the word quite widely. Yeah. And it's generally known and the, and the guidelines are known. So pe people who are interested in applying ought to be able to get access to that word and, 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 we, and we do our best to make sure that that word is out. And, and then so this year, just there were no artists who, were, no individual artists who came to us. But yeah, we even I, send I, a reminder out before the deadline. So we, <laughs> we correspond twice, and it's no. on the, you know, we make an attempt. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. And as an individual artist, I remember seeing those. So I'm not, I, I don't <laughs> want to imply that. And, that, and, that, and, that, and, yeah. and I might add, uh, new for this year, in addition to submitting a, a, a digital, app, a, you know, a, an application, you, they could also fill it out directly from the city's website. So we, we do what we can to make it make, easy for make us. it easy ish. Yeah. yeah. They still have to provide the information and make yeah. their case, but we try to make it easy. Thank you. Uh, Donna then Jack? Jack okay, Jack then Donna. Great. Um, it's really a question for the manager rather than uh, than for you folks, and that is with the but does the budget worksheet we have since on the face of it this looks like an increase. Does a but does the budget worksheet we have show that it's the 133, but it includes the $26,000 that was budgeted or balloted so last year? So the budget right now shows the 133,250. 
Um, we actually just did that at the last meeting because we'd had a the lower amount, the one, whatever it was, 120 something. So we, we adjusted that by 8,000. So we have the correct amount in, so that is the combination of everything. Last year, the budget had the 141.5 in the final approved version, but voters approved. So we've got, we're, we've matched their recommendation. Okay, budget. great, thank you. Uh, Donna. I so admire how, and Ron's been on the committee from the beginning, I think, or nearly, and then so has Michael, and, and you have put so much work into this. It's so incredible, and people should go online and read these, the link that's on the agenda. I, I do have one question, because you provided these wonderful little synopses of why you gave this or that, but there are about four, and one in particular, and I won't mention names, that didn't give you an annual report or didn't include a budget. I mean, like, it sounded like their application was really incomplete, and yet you nearly funded them 100%, and I don't understand that. Uh, you know, honestly, it's hard for me to respond without talking about individual. Uh, so so, so about on individual one hand, okay, okay. Well, uh, anyway, I was really surprised, and we, we it's sort of an up-down. We accept everything you give us or don't accept it. But that is one of my questions. If somebody hasn't given you their last year what they did and showing how they used the money, and then this year don't include enough narrative and budget, I, I don't know why you'd fund them. So I just put that out there as a question. <laughs> yeah, that's a very fair question. I mean, it's something that we very much pay attention to and had a lot of discussion about at this meeting. Um, you know, I think that there are um, give, Given the extremely broad spectrum of nonprofits who are applying to us, you know, from individual artists, grassroots nonprofits, to extremely large, sophisticated nonprofits, you know, that have budgets in the tens of millions of dollars and many, many paid staff, um, you know, while we want to hold everyone to a high standard, at the same time, I think that it's fair to say we also take into account the um, capacity of the nonprofit to comply with those standards, if that makes sense. You know, and so look at, you know, is the, to what degree is this, um, you know, for instance, maybe a really small grassroots nonprofit. Um, but I, your point is really well taken, and if you, I understand your reluctance I'll, to I'll follow out. up on this. Oh, please that's, that's do. Fine. And, yeah, please and so do the, my next question is, so when you respond to them and say, okay, you got this, but you, we didn't give you the full amount, we took out 500, you got the 4,000 instead, or whatever. Do you say next year we need this done or you don't get any money? I mean, is there any consequences? I mean, right. when, I, when I heard no budget, no narrative, and they got the money, I just, whoa. Right, and we can certainly uh, talk to a greater degree about the applications and in fact those applications, well, those applications aren't. Well, I mean, if it's so next year and it's continued, I don't know if this is the first year they were so poorly, uh, in, so poor in their application or not. I don't have that information. Right, right, right. I think the committee, I would say that the committee as a whole, we definitely can't, uh, I feel like it would probably be inappropriate for us to threaten or to project, right? And so I feel like we can only respond to what's in front of us okay. um, and not um, create consequences around like future act actions. Um, well, but you you do say because you didn't do this, we didn't give you money. Right. Yes, right. So, so there's some like people who are penalized Right. We are. hope they read that and okay. understand. Uh, council has been very uh, careful and, and thoughtful, I should say, in assembling the community fund board membership whose members are drawn from the community. And so we generally have some basis of experience or knowledge or insight for many of the applicants, not all, but, but many. And so we have this discussion when we review the applications of, how can I say this? As Christine said, there are organizations that are multi-million dollar organizations and they should know how to write an application and they should know how to read the guidelines. And there are others who are who are asking for a really small amount of money and they're delivering a really targeted service to a really targeted clientele and we know that that service is being delivered and we are more hesitant to 
penalize these one person, one and a half person nonprofits. We'd rather send them a message, you really need to do better, or we're, you're gonna sort of force our hand, if you will. And the bigger entities. I think that the other challenge that we struggle with is that some of these very small entities that Ron is describing, you know, where they might have one or two staff or no staff, right? They're entirely volunteer staff. Um, are also organizations who've received funding for the city of Montpelier for decades, right? And they're these cherished community institutions. And so that, you know, it is a, a, a challenge to weigh um, the fact that we fully understand that these are uh, institutions that are important to the community, have been supported by the city of Montpelier for so many years, and at the same time, you know, we uh, completely concur with you and want to work to hold organizations to a higher standard. Well, I think you certainly have done wonders, and, and so that's great. Th there's Thank one you. additional point, and that is we have a tr kind of tricky situation in how we communicate with grantees, uh, applicants, mm -hmm. because we can't, we're making a recommendation to the council. The council makes the final decision, right, on a yes or no. And so, um, it's difficult for us to say if you don't, you know, um, if you don't get us the, what we're asking for, we will not make the grant. We don't make the grant. We recommend the grant. Okay, and and it's you make the grant. I mean, as far as <laughs> you have the inside scoop of if right. they're meeting your criteria. That's all. That's all. So it's okay. Yeah. You don't have to talk anymore about it. If I may interject here, um, you know, the council, I think last week or one of our budget meetings had raised issues about the timing <laughs> of our scheduling, not any criticism of anything you're doing, just yeah, the, the funding, you know, what, like for example, this came in higher than what we anticipated, so do we have to change our, you know, how do we coordinate all of that to make it work? And there was some talk that after we got through this cycle, maybe in the spring, to have a conversation with you folks when there's no <laughs> pending applications and just, what could we do to make this work smoother? And it may be that maybe we could talk about these kind of topics then when we don't have pending applications. And then if the council wants to adopt a policy that says if you don't submit this, then you don't get it, or you get one shot at it. Or, and you know, it's prospective as opposed to reacting to what's. Yeah. Um, I mean, as, as it is now, we are asking people to submit a report of work in progress for funds they received in August or September in an application that they're submitting in October or November for us to appear before you in January for the item to appear on the ballot in March. So it is a... Um, to get funded almost a year later. Yeah, yeah. It, it is an awkward timeline that we're working with. Uh, Jack and then Ashley and then I would like to be moving forward. Okay. Well, Di, I don't want to belabor, belabor the point, but following up on what Donna said, you could certainly let some of these organizations know that they're, that you're getting kind of... Uh, some questioning looks from the council saying, you know, if you can't do a better job of documenting the need, the council might not be so receptive in the next year to, uh, to grant funding this request. You don't have to be the heavy because in fact you're not. Right, if it would be helpful if we had a policy yes, that said something yeah. like that. Right, you know, and overall, I think we would absolutely welcome conversation with the council around um, guidance for the fund. You know, this the, the guidelines, the, our guidance from the council has been very loose. Um, and so we would be more than happy to partake in a, um, a conversation like that because we're certainly interested in making these funds as impactful as possible. Great. Ashley. I guess I would propose, I, I reviewed all of them as well, and it concerns me that, um, you know, incomplete <laughs> filings, I, I am familiar with almost every organization on there, but I, I also feel like, you know, uh, we just had the investment policy presentation where we acknowledge that we are the city's fiduciary, and so um, I, I think that the council really needs to have, like, a, a firm policy on what expectations are about applications because... Uh, you know, like <laughs> when when I you know when I have to submit something for work that you know like if I were in private practice I would have to provide an accurate accounting of the work done for the fee paid and and it just strikes me that uh, you know I know that these organizations serve an important purpose but we're also spending you know 
residents money on these organizations and I think people are entitled to know what their tax dollars are, are doing. So I don't know what the mechanism by which the council would work on a, a policy so that we can be the ones saying you don't meet criteria, you don't qualify for funding through this program. And you can, you can apply to be on the ballot, but. Again, I'd suggest we work that through yeah. with the community fund board and just sort of from a historical perspective, it's coming from a place where these were voted by voters right. with no background no as to what was going, no vetting yes. whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolving process. So um, let's take that up, you know, when sometime in spring or summer. It'd be great. Jack. I move that we approve the uh, proposed uh, grant awards from the Montpelier Community and Arts Fund. I'll second. Further discussion? I, I guess yes. maybe just a, a procedural question. So, I mean, by definition, if it's approved at the level that's requested, we have to add that in to the budget overall budget it's already in it it's in even, even at the new yes mm -hmm. it's in. but yes you are committing that in tonight or at your next meeting you won't reduce this line in the budget right. okay there was a motion and a second uh, further discussion uh, all in favor please say aye. aye aye opposed nay okay thank you very much and, uh, really, yeah. my questions were any criticism of you. <laughs> you were <laughs> excellent. You've done such a great job. It, it's really amazing. Thank it's you. Come a long, Thank, I'm long glad list. you're asking questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, how are you doing, team? Do you need a break? Are you feeling okay? Keep moving forward. I can go to the bathroom and come back. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take let's take a five minute break. Okay. All right, so we're going to come back from uh, our brief break and moving on to our next uh, agenda item, which is the energy efficiency uh, charter change language. So uh, I just want to uh, recognize from the last time that we um, had this conversation, I was uh, in the roles of uh, champion and expert and trying to moderate the meeting, and that was um, maybe not ideal. And so uh, for this meeting, or this portion of it, I've invited a, a couple of folks here to be a part of our discussion. Um, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I will at least not be playing the role of expert um, in this situation. So go ahead if you tell us who you are and who you represent, et cetera. And there's those little uh, oh things are the microphones okay. there. Can, yeah. you, can you hear me OK? Yep. OK. Uh, my name is Richard Fazy. I am a uh, principal of a uh, energy efficiency consulting firm Energy Futures Group in Heinsberg, um, and I've been working on building energy labeling for decades. I can say more than that, but maybe that's enough. That's great. <laughs> um, I'm Phoebe Howe. I'm here with Efficiency Vermont. Um, I have background in the three years that I've been there in promoting zero energy, affordable housing, primarily focused on new construction. Um, but I'm really excited to be delving a little bit into the multifamily existing buildings realm um, with a project that I'll be doing here in Montpelier um, throughout the year. And I'll say a little bit more about that um, maybe after the initial discussion that you'll be getting into about the charter language. Great. So they're here if we have questions about the logistics of things. Um, uh, I have one comment to bring to uh, the. Just can't help yourself. I know. <laughs> well, so there's there's one edit, um, which is uh, in the language that was provided with the memo. It says an act ordinances enforcing minimum efficiency standards. It should say minimum energy efficiency standards uh, and disclosure requirements, etc. Mine has energy efficiency. Uh, the one online <coughs> does not. What, where's yours? Where, what, what are you looking at? I mine off the agenda. Yeah, it says enforcing minimum efficiency standards. It should say enforcing minimum energy efficiency oh, the standards. Last statement, oh. The last sentence in there has the. the yeah, the last part the has energy, but the there. in the beginning. So it's simple tweak. Okay, any comments from the council or questions? Connor. No, I, I just say this is uh, it, it achieves what I asked for anyways last time as far as making it broader 
I think you get too far into the weeds on this stuff, um, subject to all sorts of interpretation. So uh, it's a pretty clean cut to bring to the legislature. I think voters will look at this on a ballot and have some sense of what it means. Um, so I'm, I'm at a place where I could support it. Um, and I want to also thank Ashley for providing basically the, the base of this language. <laughs> that legal education was worth something. Yeah. <laughs> it's very helpful. Um, yeah. So, uh, any other comments? No? Would anyone like to make a motion? I would move that we um, adopt the language for the proposed charter change that is contained um, in the supporting document section of the cover sheet on the agenda with the addition of the word uh, energy before uh, before efficiency and after minimum in the first line. Second. <laughs> Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Well, that was easy. My goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Like we what happens when you bring you the experts? What do you think would be the objection to this? What should we expect people mm, to not question. understand? Uh, I think that the, there would probably not be an objection to this per se, but once, once it were considered and implemented, I think that um, those who, uh, who own buildings that they, people, the sellers perceive as being less than desirable may question um, why they'd want to make the uh, energy performance of their buildings known. Um, right. So there's, there's some resistance by sellers, and that, that has been the case in the past, of, of, um, of, of buildings that, that are not uh, sort of up to standard. And, and if I may add, yeah, go ahead. The, 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 uh, the whole objective here is to make energy visible, and so that the marketplace can work, and so that there are um, built-in uh, market incentives to improve the efficiency of buildings and to reward those who have invested and made their their properties more efficient. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and Phoebe, did you want to tell us about uh, yeah. your connection with that that uh, program with Efficiency Vermont? Sure. So I'll just take a minute. Yeah, to talk about like I mentioned, I'm going to be diving into working with multi-family um, property owners here in Montpelier, and I should add that's private, so that's not. Um, groups like Downstreet, that is uh, a private property owner. Um, so typically, multifamily <coughs> uh, rental owners are some of the hardest um, folks to reach when you're looking to advocate for energy efficiency, um, just because oftentimes, you know, as we know, tenants are paying for their heat and electricity, and so there's less of an incentive for that property owner to be investing in energy efficiency in their building. Um, that being said, there are a lot of other amazing benefits of energy efficiency. Um, for everybody, um, and specifically in the case of a multifamily property owner, um, looking at just lowering overall operational costs of their building, reducing maintenance, um, improving tenant health, comfort, um, financial situation, thereby improving their tenant retention. And so um, that's something that we're really building into our messaging as we're engaging with multifamily property owners is it is about cash flow, it's also about um, some of these additional benefits. So, um, so knowing that this has traditionally been a difficult group to reach, um, at sort of Anne's request and suggestion, um, we're excited to be really proactive in Montpelier with that group. So um, I will be conducting outreach to all those private um, multifamily rental property owners, offering a free energy walkthrough um, and sort of a concierge service as we've been talking about it, um, helping them throughout the process. So. At the very least, everybody um, who I'll be reaching out to will be able to access free LED bulbs and water saving devices in addition to that walk throughout their property. Um, and if they choose to proceed with appliance rebates, heating, cooling system, incentives, um, cash incentives for a deeper retrofit uh, air sealing insulation work, I'll be there helping them access financing, contractor networks, um, all that good stuff. So I'm really excited. I'll be um, conducting that outreach later this month and then um, visiting with folks and helping them with their projects for the rest of the year. Uh, Donna, do you work with condominium associations? Um, that's a good question. So uh, that is <laughs> Leave me your card. <laughs> so yeah, so that's outside, like that specific focus of what I'm describing. But um, 
one thing that we want to make sure um, as we embark on this specific project in Montpelier, everybody understands is that we are 100% here for whether it's the condo or the single family homeowner. Um, the proactive piece of my outreach is you know, going to be focused on those <laughs> property owners, but would love to talk to you about your condo association and what we can do. Yeah. Yep. Oh, Jeff. Um, many years ago, it's, it's good to see you here. Many years ago, when Efficiency Vermont was first created, I served for about 10 or 15 years on the Consumer Advisory Board of uh, Efficiency Vermont. And one of the things that I was looking at trying to have us do was have an automatic tie-in with the electric companies so that when someone would get a disconnect notice, they would be informed of the availability of uh, demand side management services as part of the disconnect notice. Um, is there, and I don't, I don't think it ever happened while I was there, is there any, anything like that, that with the electric companies where they refer people if they're facing disconnection? Um, so can you explain further? So if somebody is about to get disconnected for non-payment, um, you're suggesting that they be informed of options available to them to help reduce their electric costs? Exactly, mm -hmm. because especially with, uh, with low-income mm -hmm. tenants and other low-income customers, mm -hmm. if they're having trouble paying their bills, mm -hmm. helping them reduce their bills is one, one way to address that problem. Yeah, um, so um, there is not anything specifically that I'm personally aware of. Um, However, that one opportunity that I could um, pursue in my discussions with landlords would be, um, as far as they understand their tenant's financial situation, we could um, refer their tenants to Green Mountain Power's Energy Assistance Program, which reduces their electric bills by 25%. So that could be a piece to work into this if I'm able to talk to tenants directly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Great suggestion. Great. Well, thank you so much for both for being here. Thank you. Awesome. For your support. Yeah, Thank you. for sure. Okay. Uh, all right. We are making good time, team. Uh, all right. On to uh, the budget. Are you headed down that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, based on the suggestions that we make here, uh, are you or somebody else going to have a running track of? Yes, I've got the, excellence. I've got the sheet. So because it's a public hearing, I was going to do a quick overview of where we're at now for the public. Okay. And then, uh, Actually, before I forget, um, I have one question following up on the previous item, which is do we mm, we had this motion that passed this language, but we need to file should, language with the... The motion should be to file that language with the city no, clerk. I'm sorry, I should have caught that. Um, do you think we could uh, just um, quickly uh, have a separate motion to that effect, team? I'll make a motion that we file the charter change language with the city clerk. As passed. Okay, thank you, team. And, um, and set, and I know this was in that motion that Councilmember Bate just made, and set the public hearing for the January 24th. Oh, absolutely, it was right there. Well, I yep. heard you say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and the <laughs> second is okay with that? I forget who seconded. It was Connor. Connor, are you okay with that? Okay. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, thank you. Just wanted to make sure I dotted the I, across the T on that one. Okay, so on to the budget. Um, do you, how, how are you doing there, Bill? I'm doing great. Okay. Um, give me just a second. <laughs> uh, do you want us to wait for you, or shall we no, start? I'm just about ready. So my plan was to just do, for the public and for you, a quick overview of where we're at after your last meeting and then have us have our discussion and I'll put the spreadsheet back up with the running total and then we'll get there. So. Are we doing I don't know if we need it off. Um, what do you think? I mean, like, sure. Off? Not off. Not off. Oh, not, not off. off. Oh, not off. Oh, so I'm on. Sorry, no, the contrast is too bright to see that well. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so um, this is at the last meeting, um, council has held a workshop. They adopted a 
preliminary budget. So tonight is the first of two public hearings on those preliminary budgets. Council can make changes tonight and again at the following meeting on the 24th. Um, but based on last week, uh, this is a quick overview of where we're at. The FY20 budget, our goals going into it were to implement the strategic plan, continue our capital and equipment funding plan, and deliver responsible services. Uh, I won't go into detail, but we did have a strategic planning uh, work this spring, laying out uh, several areas of uh, for strategic outcomes. And while I will go through the budget, uh, at least initially, based on those uh, areas. First was community prosperity, and the budget doesn't continue to include $100,000 for the Montpelier Development Corporation. It maintains our planning and zoning staff to implement the new zoning and master plan and Im implements our TIF district. In the areas of environmental stewardship, uh, we had $5,000 for the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, uh, currently has two, a new parks position and a new tree management position. Funds stormwater projects uh, in the capital plan, includes funding for the GMT circulator bus and one-time funding to, uh, for an energy planning grant. In the inclusive, equitable, and welcoming community area, we've uh, just talked about the community fund. In fact, you just approved it. There's increased funding there. We also have new funding for the art synergy um, proposed funding. Uh, the feast program for uh, needy people at the uh, uh, senior center is continued. There is increased funding for Montpelier Alive and continued funding for our community enhancements. Under our sustainable infrastructure, we've continued our capital improvement plan and equipment funding with a, an increase, uh, as we've been doing in several years, the last several years. The water and sewer infrastructure plan is being followed. We've included a facilities and slash energy director to be begin in October, and I have funding in our capital plan for complete streets. Finally, we have our thoughtfully built, I don't know if it, actually don't think it's finally, but we have a, next, we have our thoughtfully built uh, environment area where we have included our funding for the downtown improvement district and several downtown projects. And a lot of our efforts this year is to complete uh, work of projects that are underway. And finally, our goal for more housing, we've increased uh, the housing trust fund by $50,000. And again, implementing our TIF, which we hope will um, spawn even more housing projects. In our public health and safety area, we've added a new police officer. We've uh, anticipated public events with, and, and their costs. We've continued funding our flood gauges. We've continued expansion of our paramedic program, continued funding for Project Safe Catch. And again, um, as I just mentioned, we've increased funding for the community funds, some of which goes to public health and safety um, organizations. In our responsible and responsive government, area. We've continued our communications efforts, our employee wellness uh, service levels all maintained. We've included our bridge article. This year we implemented our new Invisio dashboard with our, which is tracking our strategic plan process and available um, live at any time. And we are pursuing our own um, Access Montpelier software, which we hope to roll out um, this year so citizens can advise us and we can track requests of work. We've. Um, Tentatively set aside reserve funds for a citizen survey, strategic planning, and energy plan. This, of course, will be subject to the availability of those funds and what our fund balance ends up, but that is our tentative plan. So budget changes from last year. Um, basically, taking all those things I just said and rolling them right up into one quick list. We've increased the CIP funding by $25,000. Uh, added a new police officer position, a new tree position, a new parks position, and three quarters of a facilities director, which is intended to be a full time position to start three, a quarter of the way into the year. Increased the housing trust fund, added funding for the new art synergy program, increased Montpelier Alive, increased the community fund, um, considered $2,000 for child care funding for meetings. And uh, again, the one-time funding for that I just mentioned for energy strategic plan and community survey. So those are changes from last year's budget. Taking a look at, uh, and I'll zip through these charts pretty quickly, but here's a chart of where our funding comes from. Again, about two-thirds of this comes from property taxes. Taking a look at how our funding is uh, for different services is split up. Again, you can see our core services of police, fire, public works, and the capital plan are really the bulk of our 
both of our areas. We're about 55% personnel, uh, which is uh, always a, a struggle for us since we are such a people-oriented business. And then quickly, if we look at our various services, uh, and this will show up, th these charts will all be in the annual report. People will see them uh, more clearly than they're showing up in the sliding. But we get to see sort of how much an average person is paying in their property bill for each individual service. Someone asked me actually last week if that backed out revenues that were assignable to specific uh, agencies, and it does. So for example, the ambulance revenue has been backed out of the fire budget, and, and whereas general revenues have been prorated across. That's policy wonk stuff, but I'm happy to talk about that more if people want to know. So overall, what does that mean? It means the property tax rate would go up by 4.3 cents, or 3.9 percent. We have an average tax bill of $98. The district heat rates were already approved. The water and sewer plan is uh, estimated, water and sewer rates, excuse me, are estimated to go up 3.5% as, as per plan with no changes um, for the sewer benefit or CSO benefit. Process-wise, uh, again, tonight is our first public hearing. Thursday, January 24th would be the second and final public hearing when the council would take a final vote to, ad to adopt the budget to put on the ballot. And then the voting is on Tuesday, March 5th. Uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. with early voting usually starting around mid-February. So that's all I've got on that. Happy to answer any questions about that before we get into detail if you or the public have any questions. Okay, I'm going to officially open the public hearing on this. Um, now, I know that uh, there's maybe one or two people who had some changes that they were hoping to make. Um, and so what I would propose for how we go about that process is that we, if someone would like to make a, a change to um, what was approved last time, that we take them sort of one bit at a time. Um, and so if you have a proposal about X, then we might vote on that. And then if you have something else, then we'll um, take up the, the next thing um, separately. Does, does that sound okay, team? Or would you prefer to do it all together? I think it makes more sense to do them separately, but that's just me. What do you think, Bill? Whatever you say, Mayor. <laughs> 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 uh, <Becoming> diplomatic <laughs> <laughs> I think it's easier to do it one at a time, but that's just me. Okay, um, so if anyone would like to, I mean, I, I would like to advocate that we uh, not have the uh, the additional parks position, I, uh, I will say for myself, I think in light of Jeff's retiring, I think it makes some sense to wait on, uh, if, if we do need to have um, some additional uh, staff for the parks that we wait until Jeff is retired and then whoever is new can be a part of that hiring process. Um, I'll just say that for my part, just to kick us off. Yes. Was that a complete removal or from back to part-time instead of full-time? I would propose that we completely remove it, but that's just oh. me. I, I'm, actually, I, I'm actually inclined to agree with the mayor. I've been thinking a lot about what a budget increase. Uh, I think we even got it down to, what, 3.8%? 3, 3 3.9. Yeah. Well, the, the budget is at 3.8%. The tax increase is at 3.9%. Yeah, and I... I, I I know that we need the position, but I also know that um, you know this increase plus whatever the school budget increase is um, is is going to be significant for a number of people. And I don't make this decision lightly, but I I feel it's incumbent to be mindful that tax increases. Um, translate to increases in rents for renters and um, I think there are a lot of folks who rent in the city that just can't absorb that and I I know how important that position is and I hope that there we can find ways to work through this until maybe we can make that a budget priority for next year assuming I'm reelected I would certainly make that a priority um, but I, I just I don't think that it's something that we can fund this year. Other thoughts? Uh, Donna. 
even without the aspect of Jeff retiring and taking the work of two full-time people, the ash borer is not going to be taken care of by the one person. And so to me, when we talk about Confluence Park, public art, other things, they're based on a healthy park and tree line in the city. And we can't do that without the right park people. So at least a part-time person. I would assume that if the uh, tree person is overwhelmed, that sort of like this year when we, uh, you know, in between our budget cycle had a stopgap where we were like, you know, we have to have something in place by the time the adult, uh, you know, bugs are going to emerge in March and that doesn't work with our budget cycle. My gosh, Emerald Ashbor, if you would not please just work with our, our funding cycle, um, that we could do that again, right? Um, so that's that would be my uh, plan there if they, if it turns out to be overwhelmed. But sorry to We're disagree. We're already overwhelmed. <laughs> I, I just don't like to make a budget that plans yeah. to use our reserves. Yeah. Other thoughts? Glenn? Um, so I uh, was talking with Councillor Kruger a little bit over the weekend. Uh, Rosie and I, I think, have very different instincts about uh, many of our decisions. Uh, at the same time, I feel like um, I have come over to the mayor's current point of view <coughs> on, on this. I think that we may want to add another parks position in the future, but I don't think that we have to now. Uh, as it is, we will have two full-time parks people plus one full-time tree management position, which is one more person than we have had, if I'm correct. Uh, and uh, I think that we can afford to put this off at least a little bit. Connor? Yeah, I, I think I'd be reluctant to do it, but as I talk to people and they're seeing the rate hike, it would be my lowest priority. And I'm sort of all or nothing on this. As we spoke last time, I think if we do a part-time one, there's go they're going to be overwhelmed. Um, and if we can wait a little bit, um, I would definitely commit to doing it right after, taking some time and uh, supporting a future budget here. Do you want to weigh in, Jack? I'm kind of agnostic about this. I'm still undecided. Um, I The two things I have in mind are one um, just hearing what uh, what Connor just said which is that if we hire a half-time parks person that person will immediately be uh, overwhelmed which suggests to me that if we that a fortiori if we don't add anyone to the parks department then the the people who are there in the parks department will or will certainly be overwhelmed, but uh, I'm curious um, if uh, Jeff, I think, is still here. If either uh, if either Donna or Jeff could talk a little bit about what this new person would be doing. Well, I think Jeff, as he's walking up, for me, when I look at what Jeff and Alex do now as two people, really, and Jeff's been very clear on all his timesheets, and if you've ever been around, it's just how much time he puts in, so that when he retires, one of his concerns was the new people aren't going to do that. And so to replace just the sheer time that Jeff's doing now before the Emerald Ash Board, it's equivalent to two people. You have a new person coming in who's going to take time to get up to par. So it seems to me we don't want to understaff it now when we have this other crisis coming in. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, first, I want to clarify we don't have two full time parks people. We have two three quarters uh, for our ash folks. Um, so that's, um, that's crucial. Is it three quarters or 80%? So um, in part, uh, I'd, I'd like to move the parks out of survival mode and opportunistic mode and uh, crisis mode into a place that we can actually move forward on some of the visions the Park Commission has that, that uh, Alec and I have had and that the Council has had 
with serving new neighborhoods. That takes a certain amount of uh, letting whoever is leading the park at the time, having time to connect with landowners, work with the fundraiser that we now have, the community services, and to try to implement that in a way that wouldn't, is not so expensive for the city. Um, for the city. Um, and this, the recent proposal for Stonewall Meadows is a good example of that. If you, if you do that at fair market value, it would be very onerous in my mind for the city to get that property. But if, if someone has time to uh, really work with uh, an organization like Trust for Public Lands, work with landowners, work on donations, work on creative things, something like that can be done for a much more affordable price. Um, that's not going to happen if you have two 80 percent uh, people. Um, so yeah, I'd like to m move out of survival mode and move into creation, creating new opportunities mode is, uh, was, my, was my wish. Yeah, Connor. Are the 80 percent positions <coughs> receiving health care right now and other benefits? Yes, no, because no. while they're full time, okay. just one day a week has been allotted to tree work. Right. Yes, I, I, I was going to try to. Okay. There, so there are two people doing parks and trees, I understand. and and so two full time full -time people. Position. So, and so, if you will either, you'll either go to three or four people doing that same parks and trees work. <coughs> I think we, yeah, I'll refrain from commenting. Sorry. Further comments. Would anyone like to make a motion regarding um, this posi particular position? I, I would move that we uh, subtract the full-time parks position from the budget. Second. Further discussion? All right, um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Nay. Opposed, yeah. Nay. And so the mayor votes aye to make a fourth, and so we're gonna take that out. Where does that leave us? Uh, 3.36. Okay. Um, any other items that people would like to discuss? Uh, Glenn. Um, this is uh, my fault last time. I did not realize that we had left the arts funding at 20,000. I understood that we had cut it in half from 50,000 to 25. And that's where I thought we were. So I would love to just at least get it back to half of their funding request at 25,000 um, because I was annoyed at that. Um, Ashley. I feel really bad about this too. Um, I, I have been thinking sort of about um, the ways that we can still fund all of the things that we want to do um, while also being mindful of what that translation could look like for residents. Um, and I um, was thinking actually reducing that by another 5,000 for now. Um, and then I, I, and I, I love all of the ideas. Um, and, and I had heard some proposals bounced around about removing it completely, which I would vociferously oppose. Um, and, you know, this is like a, a super uncomfortable position to be in, but I suppose this is what we signed up for. Um, and so I, I would uh, propose that we reduce the 20,000 to 15,000, not because I don't feel the work is important, but because I feel that um, in order for us to be mindful of everyone in the community, um, I, I would rather do something um, that's not as large right now. And again, I think with the development of Confluence <coughs> Park um, and uh, you know all of the potential um, space that we have upcoming to make big decisions about, um, I would rather have those decisions in place now um, and then fund the arts once we sort of know how much space we're working with to add um, new and exciting art to. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Glenn. I think that we have an opportunity now to put as much uh, weight behind this new uh, public art plan as we can. Um, I am somewhat dubious that this will that there will be such a friendly council at all points going forward uh, to this kind of proposal, uh, and I think that uh, 
for instance, even with the Confluence Park, I believe we saw a chart uh, earlier from the, the River Conservancy folks. I'm sorry, the, the, um, from Ricarda, uh, pointing out how much of the budget might go toward art installations there. And uh, I don't remember what the number was, but it was not low. And I think that, for instance, uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but I think that, that this city money could potentially be applied to that. So when we imagine the Confluence Park, I think we can imagine budget art in the Confluence Park, or at least somewhat uh, open and, and uh, well-supported art in that kind of park. I think that this is the time to, to fund it as well as we can manage. Um, I'd love to argue for the, the full uh, request for 50,000, but I, I feel like there is no appetite for that. 25 feels less, uh, I, I hesitate to say insulting, but <laughs> tw 25 feels, feels uh, palatable to me, where less than that starts to feel like picking, picking little bits off. Would anyone else like to weigh in on this? Go ahead, Donna. I would just like to keep it at the 20. Okay. Anyone else? That's Jack? Connor? Sullivan, keep it. <laughs> so, uh, do, would either of you like to make a motion to the effect of what you are? No. I'll happily make a motion to push it back up to twenty-five. But is there a second? Okay, so. Second, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I made the motion. Okay, Thank there's you. a there's a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, well, so the motion's not passed, I'm sorry. Uh, any other items that you would like to raise? Uh, Ashley. I have um, a couple of questions. So the 100,000 for Montpelier Development Corporation, what, like, what does that do? Like, what, what is the $100,000? Like, what is the, like, is there a carry forward? Is there, is it all gone? Is it, like, how does that? Because we just so we just had them in and reviewed their activities and what they're doing. So they, this is uh, the, the five-year plan that we had with them. They keep their corporation, so the money goes to them and they retain it. So we do get a financial statement. I'm sorry, I don't have it here. I'm sure we can get it. Uh, and they use that for obviously for their staff mm -hmm. and their office expenses and those sorts of things and their rent and the, that stuff and um, whatever they use to. You know, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough about their budget to tell you exactly what they do, so I, I, I can get before the next meeting, we can probably get financial statements from them, I'm mm -hmm. sure. I guess I would like to, to see the financial statements before, like, I just, I, <laughs> I'm struggling because I think things like public art are really important and I think development is important, but I, I also want to be mindful that, like, there has to be a bit of a, a give and a take, and I don't want to spend everything focusing on the future and sort of forgetting about what that translates to, like, right now. Well, maybe this is something that we can find more information about and have for the next time. This is why we have multiple hearings. Sound all right? Yes. Okay. Anything else anybody would like to raise? Or otherwise, at 3.36, yes. Uh, it's just shifting. Um, we spoke last time about maybe moving some of these items over to the Montpelier Alive budget uh, for them to manage. One that comes to mind, like right off the top of my head, is the legislator welcome reception. Um, I think they'd be a good group to evaluate whether that's good bang for our buck. Um, as far as economic development, they're here anyways. <laughs> yeah. Dan. Hey, Dan. Did you hear that? And, and I, I just mentioned that one, but if there's other ones, maybe uh, we think we should throw in there. So just for some context, this might be a conversation that, uh, like as long as we're not talking about uh, changing the amount, right, then right. this might be the kind of thing that we could take up later. I'm okay with that. Though. Does that sound, <laughs> <laughs> does that sound okay, Dan? Great, okay. But let's, you know, let's take that up at some other time. Yeah. Okay. Further comments? Any comments from the public? Yeah, go ahead. Hi. 
I'm Liz Gensch. I live in Montpelier, and I also work at Downstreet Housing and Community Development. And I just first want to say thank you, everyone, for doing what you're doing. Um, is I really appreciate it. Um, but I wanted to talk uh, from Downstreet that we support the current $110,000 for the Housing Trust Fund in the city <coughs> budget. Um, <coughs> most of us are aware that the new French Block apartments on Main Street are now open. The lights were on last week. People are moving in on the 15th. Um, so a thank you, and it was a great celebration. Um, but what we wanted to um, emphasize tonight was that the $175,000 that the Housing Trust <laughs> Fund contributed to the French Block is one of the 10 funding sources, the very highly competitive federal and state funding sources that we received. There are many projects, as we know, across the state um, that are like the French Block on Main Streets who don't get funded. Um, so the commitment from this city and this Housing Trust Fund really matters when we apply for funding. Beyond the critical dollars that we receive from the trust fund, um, those who review our applications can see that the local community is truly invested. Um, that plays a huge role in this highly competitive funding environment. Um, and we did, we, we leveraged m millions more in part because of this. Um, and 18 new, new units. Um, but more importantly, in addition to uh, developing housing units, the trust fund also provides the deferred loan for first-time home buyers in purchasing in the city. And um, a recent home buyer, Carol Montgomery, asked us to just share a, a brief letter of, of thanks. So I'm gonna do that right now. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund for the grant given to me in July, allowing me to be a first-time home buyer of the above property in Montpelier. Moving to Vermont to be with my family is a big step financially, but one I was hoping to afford given the right circumstances. Patty Dupuy and Cheryl Moyer of Downstreet patiently led me through the many steps necessary to qualify for the down payment grant, as well as another that afforded from the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund. Together, these monies made it possible for me to go forward. Without the entirety of both of these interest-free loans, the purchase would not have been possible. In my desire to give back to the community, I'm currently serving as a volunteer for the Tree Board, Lost Nation Theater, and the Sunday evening dinner program at the Bethany Church. Many friends and family have visited since my moving here, and all have commented on how obvious it is to them that I have truly adopted Montpelier as my home. Thank you for your generosity. Great, thank you. Any further comments? Dan Groberg, Executive Director of Montpelier Live. I'm a resident of Liberty Street in Montpelier. Um, I'd like to encourage the council to uh, reconsider Montpelier Live's full request for an additional $10,000 <coughs> in uh, funding uh, for next fiscal year. Uh, this has been a really exciting year for Montpelier Live. Uh, Montpelier Live is directly responsible for bringing two major conferences to Montpelier in June, the New England Foundation for the Arts Creative Communities Exchange, uh, as well as the State of Vermont's Downtown and Historic Preservation Conference, each of which will bring 300 people to Montpelier over a three-day period. They're back-to-back -back in early June. Um, related to the French Block, uh, the French Block leveraged over $200,000 in downtown tax credits that are only available for that project because Montpelier is a designated downtown. Montpelier Live being the organization that allows Montpelier to be one of those designated downtowns. We bring a lot of value uh, to Montpelier, uh, both things that are very visible and things that are less visible. Um, I, I've heard uh, Councilwoman Bate, for instance, talk about the administrative fee uh, in the DID as an alternative option. Um, and the challenge with that would be that you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul in that option, where there are many worthy projects that are supported through the DID budget, where we'd be taking money away, essentially, from the work that we're actually doing in the community through the DID budget were we to take an administrative fee out of that. Um, so while that's one great option, I, I think a better option would be uh, for the, the increased funding that would actually allow us to do both the work and support the um, administrative costs of actually doing that work. Um, so I, I encourage the council to, to reconsider that and, and consider our full request. Thank you. Um, I just want to put out there that I, I would support adding that 5000 back in. I um, don't know if anybody else would, but uh, I... Oh, okay. Would anybody like to make a motion to that effect? Um, 
<clears throat> I'll move to restore the $5,000 to Montpelier Alive. For, for a total, total of $10,000. Thank you. Second. Further discussion? Can you see what? <coughs> yeah, what does that do? Two. I'm so thankful for this. We're definitely keeping this for next year. <laughs> Maybe not the board, I don't know, but this. Um, would anyone else like to weigh in on that? No? Okay. I guess I, I would propose then that we take it out of the MDC. I, I just I I appreciate that it's only five thousand dollars, but that it's it's also like I even three point four makes me really uncomfortable and I I understand that both serve really important functions, but if you're pricing everybody out that then who is I mean, like <laughs> Yeah. If if that's being seriously considered, I would withdraw my request for the additional funds. I think that would be um, very short-sighted uh, to remove any funding from the MDC. They're a startup uh, in startup mode. Um, they are, have not yet been able to leverage um, any additional funds, and the city funding is critical to what they do. Um, so I would I would caution the council not to make that choice. Jack. I. <coughs> I know that we're uh, likely to have uh, some more discussion of the uh, Montpelier Development Corporation at our next hearing. Um, we had a presentation from them very recently, and it's this is one of those things. This is a, a type of endeavor that's very hard to really see. Well, what's it doing? How do we evaluate it? And uh, so it's 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 just the very nature of it. But uh, it the uh, also the nature of it is that uh, investing the money over a number of years can bring about some uh, some production, some uh, increased growth and vitality and revenues to the city in future years that wouldn't happen unless we've been putting those years in, those, that money in for years. And so I'd be concerned about cutting the development corporation at, at this point. Because I think, as, as the manager mentioned, the council adopted a five-year plan. Um, the, uh, there was staffing turnover just within the past year. And so it feels like they're just getting a running start, and I hate to uh, uh, undermine that. So we did. We did have a motion and a second. And a second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on on this? Uh, okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Yay. Okay. So that passes, and uh, so we're at three point four two. All right, any further things folks would like to discuss? Yes. And then Glenn, did you have, was that a hand? One, yeah. Okay. I am Dan Dickerson from the Parks Commission. I'm told that I think I missed the boat on, on this, but I do want to take a few moments to just um, recognize someone that's spent countless hours of, of his life above and beyond the, the normal 40 hour work week to maintain our parks. Um, come to Parks Commission meetings, to come to City Council meetings, to lead volunteer groups, to, to take volunteer groups on, on trips, and that's Jeff Beyer. Um, within a matter of months, he, as far as I know, he's gonna be retired from the city, and I do not wanna create the expectation of our next Parks Director that that, that should be the standard. Um, and so, given the fact that when we lose him, we lose close to a, a full-time staff person above the parks director position, we're losing a lot. And getting an additional position, whether it's this coming year or next year or the year after, hopefully it's not that far out, is, is vital to, to our parks department. 
you know, not only maintaining the existing park infrastructure that we have, but maintaining Confluence Park, maintaining new trails at North Branch, potentially maintaining trails at Moore's Farm, which is a huge opportunity for the city, given it, although it's, it's in East Montpelier. Um, there's a lot of potential out there. Um, and, and with the two staff people we've had, you know, we've sort of just tread water for a long time. And I just want to say that having that position is, is really, really important to um, the Parks Commission, to the Parks Department, to the city. Um, I apologize that I didn't get this message to you sooner, and, and I did send a letter. I apologize for not getting that to you sooner, but um, I at least want to take the opportunity to stand in front of you and, and just sort of try to expound how, how important this position is. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Glenn. Um, yeah, I see that letter now, just now. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> uh, but I wasn't going to talk about that. I, I did want to just come back briefly to the um, potential funding set aside for the citizen survey. Bill happens to have it selected uh, on there by right random. now, I think, <laughs> by, by random. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and as I understand it, that's <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, as as I understand it, that five thousand dollars that now is not in there uh, was to be set aside for future. future. So five thousand a year for three years or something to pay for the next survey. Um, and uh, thinking it over, that feels like it really is worthwhile and something that we should at least consider more. Uh, explicitly because I think that it's uh, something that would pay back and more um, and it's a again relatively small yearly uh, set aside so I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about it but I thought I would bring it back to our attention uh, I this was a, a long-standing thing from Alan Weiss a lot many years ago, wasn't it? Wasn't he a champion well, of the survey? He was. We, you know, in 2009, we did the National Citizen Survey, and yeah. it was, in my opinion, at least, very helpful and valuable. It got us a lot of good information, including demographic things. And at that time, we thought we thought we would do it every couple of years. And funding being what it was, we kept putting it off. And uh, it struck me that we're you know now coming up to 2019, and it's been will be 10 years, so it was time to, to do it again. Um, and uh, so I was proposing to do that out of one-time money this year, so we can get it done. But then say, hey, you know maybe we set some money aside, we can do it every three years. But you know we can look at that. We could do 7,500 next year. We could, you know there's I mean I appreciate the support for it. I think it's really important. I think communities that use this tool the best use it regularly and then use it to benchmark themselves and track their performance. Uh, you know, every 10 years is interesting. Every two or three years is really, you know, measuring what you're doing. But, um, you know, I, I, we also have numbers to hit, so. Um, I, I mean, I would just say that as someone who loves data and uh, especially, you know, the considering the community uh, indicators that we are hoping to keep track of um, and there were a lot of requests from the last time we were talking about the community indicators of uh, for data that doesn't really exist right now and there might be some opportunity uh, with the survey to uh, to get some of those uh, critical pieces of information that uh, that is otherwise not being tracked um, so anyway I just want to put that out there as that opportunity I would be down for adding um, this but uh, See if anybody else is. What do you mails like to weigh in? Yes, Donna. Well, I just don't want to keep adding all these small things because we are going to need more parks personnel and we're going to have to face that. And we may have other things we need. So I think it's misleading because we took 55,000 out and suddenly we've been adding these little things that we're going to get ourselves in a worse bind than if we just had stayed with the 55. Fair enough. Other thoughts? Uh, would anyone like to make a motion uh, regarding this item? Sure. I move that we put uh, $5,000 in for a citizen survey once a year. Is there a second? Second. 
Okay, further discussion? Any other comments? No? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Nay. Oh, and I don't, I would not make a fourth. So, um, so that one fails and moving on. How are you doing, team? You doing okay? Unless you want to be done. Any, any other items that, or any comments from the public? I'm just going to make my statement again. I just, I just did some rough math, and um, I realized that there's not a direct correlation between like how much rent increases and how much property taxes increase, but it, it, it translates to a relatively significant number when you're talking about folks who are really trying to just sort of get by in this city. And um, I... I understand that we have priorities and difficult decisions to make, um, but I, I really, um, I, I am struggling to accept a 3.42 increase. And at this, in addition to the school budget increase that, that we're waiting to hear you know, definitively, I, th I think, which is next. Oh, um, I don't know Two what weeks. that is. You know, I don't know. I, well, we will we'll get their numbers, obviously, because it has to go on the ballot. Right. Um, now that they're a separate school district, I don't know if they'll be coming in to present to us like they used to. Oh, that's a interesting point. It'll be a conversation to have with them. I can we invite them? We should invite them. To I just I feel like yeah. this is sort of the way that people like get this information. Right. Well, it will all be in the annual report together, and we usually put it all together. I will communicate with them about but that. But it would be really yeah. helpful. Yeah, we, we always have that for the last budget here. I bet we totally. have to anyway, because we still have to put it on the ballot. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, further thoughts, team? Jack? I'm pretty happy where we are. I'm not uh, thinking of anything that I would ask to either add or uh, uh, subtract. Okay. Further comments? Okay. So, uh, any comments from the public? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. And I'll make a motion to uh, advance the budget as uh, we've amended it during tonight. And set and the next set public the sixth, next public hearing for January 24th. Great. Second. Further discussion? All right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Thank you, team. And uh, all right. So on to council reports. Would anyone in particular like to start? Go ahead, Jack. I'll start. Um, Last Thursday night, uh, we had the uh, open house and celebration for the new apartments at uh, the French Block. And for anyone who didn't, who, who missed it or wasn't able to be there, it was it was a great event. Um, we got a chance to see the new apartments, the the work that Down Street did to uh, renovate that building that's been a blight in Montpelier for 80 years was. Uh, was incredible, and uh, I heard a lot of people there who were uh, wandering around touring the, the apartments who were clearly not people who were candidates for uh, affordable housing, but pe middle class people who were saying that uh, they could picture living in a place like that uh, right in the center of town. <coughs> and. Uh, I hope that there are other uh, people who own property downtown who uh, who see the response that uh, <coughs> that this housing has gotten and think about uh, putting uh, putting their uh, business uh, their property to similar use in town. We can still use a more uh, housing right in the center of the city, whether it's uh, affordable renters, rentals as we saw uh, last week or uh, market rate rentals or even uh, condominium ownership for uh, quite affluent people in the city. Th those all could be good uses for buildings <laughs> in downtown Montpelier. Cool. Thank you. Pass. Whoever wants to start. 
Uh, I'll be at Baggy Joe's tomorrow morning at 8.30. Uh, and uh, I'll just say it's been going really well there. Sometimes no one shows up, and I get to check my email, which is great. Uh, other times uh, some single person shows up, and we have a long conversation. A couple of weeks ago, uh, former counselor Jim Sheridan sat down with me, and uh, we talked for a while. Mostly he talked, and I uh, <laughs> listened. And, and I'm afraid I, I may not have uh, done everything that he suggested I might do, uh, but I really appreciated the conversation. Um, I really look forward to continuing it into the new year. So feel free to show up anytime, 8.30 to 9.30 every Thursday at Aguido's. Okay, a couple things. First, uh, big props to Sheila and John Odom for all the work they're doing on the charter change advocacy there. There have been regular meetings with uh, Roberta, who you've seen a couple times here. I think they've, they're putting together a really good game plan. Uh, committee assignments were released today for the House, so we all have to be really nice to Representative Sarah Copeland Hansis, <laughs> who's the new chair of government operations. And I think the new makeup is uh, more favorable than the previous makeup of the committee. Hopefully get some of these charter changes through. Along those lines, I don't know who sets the agenda for the legislative welcome reception, uh, but I do believe if we're hosting this and investing in it, um, we should devote some time for a couple minutes for folks to talk about both the bag ban and the non-U.S. citizen voting change there. Um, you know, they're going to enjoy themselves if they have to be subjected to listening to us too for a bit. Uh, <laughs> so I'd make the point of that. And then I, I sent around just um, just the RFP for the child care for the city of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, which I, I think gives some good indications and might be just a seed of developing a, a policy for us with our $2,000 that we're hopefully working with for child care. Uh, but Tiffany Simino, who works for the mayor's office in Pittsburgh, said she'd be more than happy to uh, be hands-on on this and help us develop an approach that fits Montpelier. So that's it for me. Thanks. Um, actually... Have you been to one of the Welcome Back legislators? I've gone for well, years, go both as a council member and as a, it, when I was in public transportation. And they're never quiet. I think it, it maybe I think it's true. We need to really assess what is that event, what mm. is it worth. Um, but I do want to go back to, to Jack's comment about the French block. It was just wonderful, and really kudos for the housing, all those who involved in it, and that they kept some of the really quirky, unique features of the building, archways, uh, just, it was wonderful. But I'll tell you, everybody was looking at the kitchen cabinets. I mean, I got into more conversations with people. <laughs> oh, I want that many cabinets at my house. <laughs> because it was such a wonderful use of space. It really was delightful. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything to add, so I'm going to pass. Uh, just a couple things. Also, congratulations for French Block. Really fabulous uh, moment for the city and for those those things. And there's one who looks out the window at, at the building. It's nice to see some activity. Um, just wanted to comment quickly about the recent appeal of the the DRB decisions on the farmer on the uh, parking garage. Um, did speak with our attorneys today. We are advised to limit our comments because we are in active litigation. Uh, so anything that you have, please refer to the mayor or me through that. Um, and so we'll probably have more of a statement at some point. Um, but I, I would say that we need to think about this to the extent that it delays or creates uh, problems for our, our project because we have a lot of other projects that are somewhat dependent on it. This, this discussion of what they called Confluence East was solely due to the fact that we were going to have more parking. Uh, and some of the other discussions about bike lanes and those kind of things were due to the fact that we are going to have more parking. And so I think we need to be thinking about the timing of all of those things. There's a, a ripple effect of, of uh, these types of projects that you know may or may not have been what this group of people intended when they, when they move forward. But that's. OK. All right, so um, was there, so Ashley, did you want to oh, say something? 
Um, I see two representatives from the Social and Economic Justice Committee here. I think we were supposed to be on the agenda tonight, but I dropped the ball and didn't get the information to bill that I was supposed to. And so I wasn't sure if either of you wanted to address the council just briefly or if there was anything that you wanted to. I apologize that it's out of turn. It's okay. And Bill did mention to me that they were here and I... Great. And then and then we'll be done. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Here, yeah, no problem. Hey, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Julia Shapitz, um, one of the co chairs of the committee. I'm still Michael Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I have uh, we have not come before you, you may have noticed, to present a charge. Um, and I think that that is an important piece of what uh, the work that we are needing to do and, and struggling with at the moment. Um, uh, I have, over the last uh, couple of weeks, I've met with, uh, we've, I've met with um, five of the seven current members um, individually to, to talk about that and what that might look like. Um, and I have a draft here that I'd be happy to, sh I don't know if now is the yeah. Uh, yeah. appropriate sure. time to share it. Um, um, oh, I didn't keep a copy for my truck. <laughs> send one back. Oh, look at that. Wow. Very prepared. Thank you. Um, It strikes me as I, as I listened tonight that every single issue that you discussed tonight and probably ever discuss um, has implications for social and economic justice. And um, I think that is a piece of the struggle. I think that's a piece of why we've been uh, having a hard time getting going on this. Um, and one of the things that's, that's, being, that's clear to me both in my background and working with groups of people as well as with this particular group, that um, that having a clear purpose is going to be part of what propels us forward um, into action. <laughs> um, and so I think we're needing some guidance from the city council. Um, but this is our start. Um, I think clarity and specificity about what we do will be really key. As we try to move forward. So I would love your comments. Do you have anything you want to add to what I said? I think we just. Are, are struggling because we we didn't really get a sense from the beginning of what the council was asking of, of us, um, and you know the word advisory in the in the title um, is is um, kind of vague. Although um, advise you about what, and um, I think for some of us the question is are we t are we there to um, receive specific requests from you, or are we supposed to take a, a more proactive role in going out and sort of looking at questions of social and economic justice, which I will say is a bottomless well. Yes. <laughs> and, and, that, and that is a problem. Because, and even the two requests that we think we have um, throw us into an area of expertise that, that few of us have. And so we... Um, this, this, any request is going to require us to do research or, and or bring in people who know more about it than any of us or, or most of us on the committee. And so this is a real, this is a real important question. What is, it, what is your expectation of, how, of what we're going to be doing so that we at least have some sense of boundaries? So my sense right now, um, and I'm happy to be wrong about this, but I would love to take this and digest it um, and talk about it again um, on the either the 24th or the next meeting, depending on when we have time. The 24th is already, last I looked, it was really full. But, it, but this might, either we can fit it in or it's soon thereafter. Um, how, do, how do you feel about that, team? Yeah, I would say, um, trying to think what our next meeting in February It's, uh, it's February, it's like, uh, no, it's January 15th. Oh. Yeah. So. So we wouldn't be meeting before then anyway. Right. And so in February, it's the. So it's the third? The third, 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 Tuesday. third Tuesday. 
Mm-hmm. So we'd be meeting the second Wednesday. So we'd be meeting on the 13th of February. So that Which would, would be in advance of that. I think that makes, I think that would work. Oh, thank you, Todd. Oh, yes, look at that. Let's oh, get up, let's get up to date. We're like woefully behind. <laughs> it's like being home. <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh, that one's going. We're still not in February. Oh, do we get the well, wrong we, we, year? we don't even we get to February. Year. <laughs> you're down, you're down there. I mean, to be fair. I, th- I think I think that's the fe- our February meeting is still before the next committee meeting in February. Yeah, so. it's up in the January. Mm-hmm. So that would mean that for, that we we really would not be able to we wouldn't know whether we're supposed to go forward, for example, on the ordinance that you're talking about on the living livable wage by um, your next meeting. Be, because you mean? we were told we're that not, you wanted something from us in March. Right, but that but we could work with that. I don't okay. think that that was an initial goal, but some of these are. Right. All right. Dragging. Mm, that's okay. <laughs> um, Our first meeting in February is the 13th, and then the second is the 27th. Okay. Um, is, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Uh, are, are you saying that for your January meeting, which is between now and the 24th, um, you may still be in the same situation of not right. knowing what to do, and that's yes. the problem? Um I, I think that's true, but I also think we have this now, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which yeah. is more than we've had. Yeah. Um, and I think there are I think there are things that can happen. I mean, I I think there are things that that. Yeah, I mean, I would trust you all to f- figure that out between. Um, well, let me rephrase. I I think uh, either continuing to work on that ordinance or operating under this. Um, uh, these guidelines would be fine until, until then. Does that seem? I don't know if that would be helpful. <coughs> I mean, I, I mean, in my personal view, I think it's uh, it's more helpful to, that there be a thoughtful process around what our purpose is. Yeah, so I enough. think the fact that that you all took take the time to talk about it is more important than okay. you deciding something right. right now. Well, and <laughs> and if in the uh, the interim, if it makes more sense for you to cancel your January meeting and just pick up again in February, then, you know, that could happen too. Uh-huh. I mean, up to you. <laughs> Whatever you... Yeah, we're not sk- scheduling your meetings for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is there anything that... I mean, is there anything that... I guess, I don't know what my question is. Is there anything that any of you would like us to know about... How, I'm struggling. I'm I'm new, so new to working within city government. Um, I would love guidance on how should we be working with the city manager's office. Um, uh, how, how should we be working with each of you individually as counselors? Um, what specific kinds kinds? Uh, any just like thoughts that you have now about yeah. how we can be helpful to you? So I I would uh, add unless Donna you you, you go ahead. I was going to say go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, I, I would say usually for other committees, um, v- we often have a council rep, and so usually it's, you know, you would go through the council rep to uh, either communicate about issues that might be relevant or questions that are unresolved that you could use some advice about or, um, you know, in terms of direction, are we going in the right direction? That usually is relayed through your um, city councilor. Mm-hmm. All, that is also to say that there's nothing preventing you from, you know, talking with the rest of us, obviously. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's and, anything and else. And we have had manager's office staff attending your James meetings, and, although yeah. she probably won't be there right, so, this yeah. week, mm-hmm. <laughs> this month. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but, yeah, okay. so yeah. We'll try to support that as much as we can. and certainly sure. happen to talk about any of that. Okay. I know. Uh, Don? I think also one of your issues it comes, comes back to your mic. comes back to the council, and that is we haven't really talked about it. It yes. seems to me <laughs> three years ago when none of these people were like half, and when only Ann and I were here, <laughs> were the remains of three years ago. And we talked about it. And even when we did the Black uh, Lives Matter resolution, in my mind, one of the kickoffs was really having awareness workshops for the council, for the committee, for the community. So we could start really generating a mindset before we try to start implementing policies. 
So, and I may be the only one there, but see, we haven't had our conversation with this council. So you're a good reminder that we have to do our work in order to help you do your work. Thank you. So yeah. thank you for coming <laughs> and, and going to all the meetings and doing what you have done. The conversations there are good. Good. Um, I'm new too. Uh, I still feel new anyway, as, as Donna uh, pointed out just now. Um, and I don't know if it would be helpful, but it was interesting, Michael, to, to think about the word advisory, uh, advisory committee. and it might make sense to uh, talk with my partner Kate of the Energy Advisory Committee and, and how she has and, and that committee has structured itself to kind of in the way that you were describing earlier uh, is the committee there to answer specific questions that the council asks or is the committee there to Initiate. explore right. new policies and I think that Kate would say both and in these specific ways over the last few years. So you might sit down with her and yeah. get I've some structure That's on my to-do list, actually. <laughs> Thank you. There, there are different models. For example, there, there is the Vermont Advisory uh, Committee to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. And they have always taken on independent studies based on, I, I guess, issues that, uh, that arise. And then there are advisory committees where you get a very specific charge we're, we're looking at this issue, what, you know, what should we be thinking about? What are the things that you see that we may not be seeing? And those, those are different models, uh, and it would be helpful to know which, which, if either of those models you had in mind. And if you're gonna say both, well then, all right. We, you know, we, we <laughs> would then have to be prepared, but it's a big, that's asking a lot of people who, who don't necessarily have expertise in some of these issues. That's and I think that's, you know, just from having watched whether it was the Energy Committee or the Housing Task Force and others over the years that have taken on certain topics, I don't think there's anything wrong either with saying that's, that's over our head. You know, thanks, but, you know, this, this is the opinion, the collected op opinion of the people on this board, but we, we don't have the expertise to delve into this any further, or, or we would need more support to really give you any good advice. I don't, I, there's not, you know, as you say, there's a never-ending well of these topics that we could talk about, and, um, and 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 there are lots of ways to get at it too. Right, right. And, and uh, you know, I listen. I mean, I'm not a voting member here, but I, you know, I was listening when this was formed, and I think there was a, a sense that there might be certain things that the council would refer and say, hey we'd like your way in on this before we approve it. There was also a sense that there would be some community engagement that you might initiate and say, you know, we'd like to do these workshops, we'd like to do these whatever forums, or, or, or you know, however you set that up. Uh, and that there might be things that you see, you know, for example, just, you know, we're going about our mayor. We, we, the city council and city staff have a zillion <laughs> things going on. And so there's could be an opportunity for someone to say, whoa, have you thought about you know, I see that you're just barreling along with scooters or, you know, whatever. <laughs> just using it as a for instance. But, you know, have you given any thought to that impact on this community by doing that? And, you know, time out or at least as you, you know. So I think all, all of that could be really helpful and just maybe your agendas are sort of, you know, what's, what's our project? What's our forum? What's our, is there anything we want to weigh in on type thing? And, you know, or split up work amongst individual members and come together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, the one further thing I would say is, uh, could you send this to us electronically? Yes, that I'll would be, be great. Yep. Okay. Should, what's the best? Do I send it to? Should I send it? Uh, send yeah. it to you. There you go. Send it to you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks and squeeze in the sin. <laughs> well, yeah, no problem. And with that, uh, we are going to, without objection, adjourn. We made it before nine thirty. Yeah. yeah.